Good morning, everyone. It is seven o'clock. Very welcome to join us on The Breakfast Show Thursday morning here on Sky News. An escalating row this morning over accusations from the Home Secretary that the police are playing favourites with protesters. Labour says Suella Braverman is out of control. We'll hear their view on pro-Palestinian marches later on. And we'll speak to the Transport Secretary, Mark Harper. It's Thursday, the 9th of November. A government source brands the Home Secretary ignorant after she says hate marches are what we are more used to seeing in Northern Ireland. A poll for Sky News finds half of Britons think Saturday's Armistice Day, Day march by pro-Palestinian protesters should be banned. Also ahead, the government orders an independent inquiry into the deaths of 27 people in the English Channel in 2021. Making tech safer, Ofcom unveils new rules to protect children online. At the Republican debate here in Miami, candidates expressed unequivocal support for Israel in its fight against Hamas. The end of Panda diplomacy, three of the giant bears on loan from China to the US, shipped home and... drops its highly anticipated Christmas advert with an unusual star of the show. When we say dropped, we mean it's just landed. You probably got that. Good morning. The Home Secretary has accused the Metropolitan Police of playing favourites with protesters. Suella Braverman claimed that senior officers are biased and employed a double standard towards pro-Palestinian marchers compared to right-wing protesters. She also compared what she calls hate marches to sectarian parades in Northern Ireland, provoking a furious response from within the government, with one source describing her as ignorant. Writing in The Times, she said, I do not believe that these marches are merely a cry for help for Gaza. They are an assertion of primacy by certain groups, particularly Islamists of the kind we are more used to seeing in Northern Ireland. Also disturbingly reminiscent of Ulster are the reports that some of Saturday's march group organisers have links to terrorist groups, including Hamas. She went on, unfortunately, there is a perception that senior police officers play favourites when it comes to protesters right-wing and nationalist protesters who engage in aggression are rightly met with a stern response, yet pro-Palestinian mobs displaying almost identical behaviour are largely ignored when clearly breaking the law. Mari's here with us this morning. Uh, oh, what's she thinking? That's the question, isn't it, Kay? I think there are lots of speculation about why she might have made this intervention. One would be that she's trying to get herself fired. Another is that she's trying to, uh, once again, pitch herself as the next leader of the Conservative Party were they to lose the next election. There are lots of theories behind why she would be doing this. I think what will be very interesting will be to find out whether Rishi Sunak signed off on this op-ed or not. I tried to speak to Number 10 this morning and ask them that they wouldn't confirm or deny either way whether Sunak had signed off on this op-ed and therefore whether he believed and agreed with some of the things that she's been saying. And I think that will really be key. But also, the fallout is extraordinary so far. So let me read you just a quote from a senior government source and their reaction to her op-ed. They've said it's wholly offensive and ignorant of where people in Northern Ireland stand on the issues of Israel and Gaza. And they go on to say... It's clear that the Home Secretary is only looking after her misguided aspirations for leader rather than being respo a responsible leader as a Home Secretary. Now, the Labour Party have called her out of control. They've said she's undermining respect for the police and that she's also inflaming community tensions. I think what will be interesting is how Tory MPs and even ministers behind the scenes react to this op-ed and whether they all pile in behind her 
or whether we start to see more divisions. Already, from what she's been saying about hate marches, we've seen cabinet splits, we've seen every minister so far on your sofa not so that they would use those words. And I think that is really interesting. And also important to add, the Met Police for now have not uh, commented on this. No, I'm sure they won't either. Let's see. Uh, Mark Harper, Transport Secretary, talking to us very shortly. Uh, thanks very much, Mary. But for now, um, David standing by in Belfast. Um, is she looking for trouble, David? Well, that is indeed the question. This is a staggering op-ed, quite frankly. Uh, many people will see it not as an own goal by the Home Secretary, but as a hat-trick of own goals, because they will regard it as ignorant, offensive, and dangerous in terms of Northern Ireland. Uh, she has demonstrated a, a, a breathtaking ignorance in relation to this place because it is Protestant loyal orders who are responsible for the vast majority of marches here. And we're talking about people who would be natural allies of her Conservative and Unionist Party. They are pro-Union, pro-Brexit, pro-Israel, everything that Suella Braverman stands for. Uh, and she will have deeply offended them by these remarks because they claim to march in defence of the Protestant faith, i.e. Christian. So they won't take kindly to being likened to those who march in defence of Islam. Also, I think it's worth noting that if she was intending to refer to the Catholic civil rights marches of the late 60s and 70s, has she forgotten Bloody Sunday when 14 innocent people were shot dead uh, by the British Army at a civil rights march in Derry? But most notably, it is highly dangerous. These are inflammatory words to use Hamas and terrorism in the same breath as marches and Northern Ireland is, is very uh, destabilising at a time when there is already a political vacuum here because there is no power sharing government in Northern Ireland. Uh, the, the relationship between the DUP and the government is already cool. This won't do anything to thaw that ice. OK, for now. Thank you. What does the public think? Tom's here. Yeah, we've done a poll, 2,000 people over the last we'll couple how. of days. So this is rapid reaction. And, you know, there has been this criticism as the government's being authoritarian. We asked that should this march be banned on Saturday, on Armistice Day, 50% of the public think it should be banned. So that is a very clear majority in an issue where everything else is more or less divided. 50% of people saying they don't think this march should go ahead. So, you know, those criticisms of perhaps being too authoritarian when it comes to Armistice Day and the whole... Uh, Remembrance Sunday, although the march isn't happening then, the public do not think that should be happening. But when it comes to everything else, all the other questions we ask, the public are really divided about this. So we asked, which side did you agree with more? This is something the YouGov, who did the poll for us, they've been tracking um, over the course of the conflict. And you can see here, it's fairly entrenched. In terms of the Palestinian side, the Israeli side, they're both around 20%. What we've seen is this massive change from people who didn't know before uh, you know, back in May, no one, there were nearly 50% of people didn't know who they favoured. Now that's dropped to actually favouring both sides equally. So a lot of sympathy from the British public for both sides. But those two, Palestinian and Israeli sides, they're really entrenched. They haven't shifted. And it's really based along age lines. So younger people favouring Palestine and Labour voters favouring Palestine. That doesn't seem to change. And then lastly, in terms of what should be happening. So we know what the government position, we know what the opposition position is on what's happening in Israel. They've all said there should... Uh, Israel should be allowed to pursue its military action, but there should be a so-called humanitarian pause. Actually, they're a bit out of step with the public on this. M the majority, uh, the most popular option from the public is that there should be a full ceasefire and that Israel's actions in Gaza should be opposed. So that's quite interesting. And then, again, if you go under the bonnet with that, look at Labour voters in particular, in terms of where Keir Starmer is compared to them, they really support a full ceasefire. They're five times more likely to support that. So, uh, Keir Starmer is sort of in step with Rishi Sunak and in step with NATO allies, but Labour voters, they don't agree with that. That, again, could be an issue like we've been talking about over the last week. OK, Tom, for now, thanks very much indeed. Well, let's take you to um, Israel now. It says its troops had advanced to the heart of Gaza City with one military spokesperson warning that Hamas leaders are now dead men walking. The US has struck a weapons storage facility in eastern Syria near Deir Ez-Zor, Secretary of Defence Lloyd Austin said the strike was a response to attacks against US personnel in Iraq and Syria by Iranian-backed forces. Late last night, the Israel Defence Forces released a video of a strike on a building that they said was being used by Hezbollah militants in Lebanon. The target of the strike has not been independently verified. 
The Rafa border crossing into Gaza remains closed this morning due to what US officials are calling an unspecified security circumstance. It's expected to be reopened again at regular intervals to allow aid trucks into the Gaza Strip and to allow foreign nationals to leave. Cordelia is in Jerusalem for us this morning. Hi, Cordelia. Good morning. Update us on the latest, if you would, please. Good morning, Kay. There are talks here of a possible three-day ceasefire. As we understand it, that is being negotiated between Qatar, Egypt and the United States. We know that the Biden administration behind closed doors has been pushing for a humanitarian pause. So far, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has said that any kind of temporary ceasefire, ceasefire would have to be accompanied with the release of hostages. Uh, there are local reports that there is currently a discussion, Kay, of 12 hostages being released in addition to that three-day temporary ceasefire. But there is no official confirmation yet. We know uh, that a top CIA official was in Egypt earlier in the week uh, having talks there. If that were to come about, it would allow for the critical humanitarian aid and fuel to get inside Gaza. It is a desperate situation. Uh, there are more than 10,000 now dead, according to the Gaza Health Ministry, Kay. OK, for now, thank you. Looking at some of today's other headlines on the programme, we now Thursday morning breakfast show Sky News. Ofcom has published its first guidelines to tackling illegal content online. The regulator has told social media uh, to exclude children from suggested friends lists, preventing children from becoming friends with or messaging unrelated people. The US Actors Union has agreed to what it says is a tentative deal with Hollywood studio bosses to end its 118-day strike. The dispute has delayed films including Disney's Lilo and Stitch, or is it Lilo and Stitch, and the latest Paddington movie. And blood tests to help detect early Alzheimer's could be available on the NHS within the next five years. The UK's leading dementia charities are funding a £5 million study to help bring tests into clinical use. Scientists say it would be cheaper than current methods and allow patients to become diagnosed sooner. Donald Trump again absent from the latest Republican presidential debate last night. His five rivals all vying for the party's candidacy addressed voters this time in Florida while he held a rally nearby. Let's get more with Martha. Hi, Martha. So the big man not there again. It was. This was the second to last of these debates, Kay, among the final opportunities for these Republican candidates to present themselves to voters as a real viable alternative to Donald Trump. In honesty, I'm not sure that any of them managed to move the dial a great deal. The first hour of this debate focused mainly on foreign policy. There was a broad verging on bloodthirsty consensus among the candidates in support of Israel's offensive in Gaza. Donald Trump, as you said there, a no-show yet again at these debates. Not that it seems to be affecting his chances very much at all. In downtown Miami, inside a centre for the performing arts, a piece of political theatre without the lead actor. In the absence of Donald Trump far ahead in the polls, the five candidates battling to change the minds of Republican voters. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis was once a Trump acolyte, now he's a critic. And from debate host Lester Holt, the key question. Why should you and not him be the Republican nominee to face Joe Biden a year from now? Donald Trump's a lot different guy than he was in 2016. He owes it to you to be on this stage and explain why he should get another chance. Nikki Haley is bidding to be America's first female president positioning herself as the leading anti-Trumper. I can tell you that I think he was the right president at the right time. I don't think he's the right president now. This is the first debate since the beginning of the Israel-Gaza war and from all on stage, a hawkish stance. As president of the United States, what would you be urging Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to do at this moment? I would be telling Bibi, finish the job once and for all with these butchers, Hamas. They're terrorists. 
They're massacring innocent people. They would wipe every Jew off the globe if they could. He cannot live with that threat. It is not that Israel needs America. America needs Israel. They are the tip of the spear when it comes to this Islamic terrorism, and we need to make sure that we have their backs in that process. It's now just two months until the Iowa caucuses, which kick off the Republican nomination process. Inside this spin room, candidates like Ron DeSantis insisting that it's not a foregone conclusion that Donald Trump will be the pick. Five dollar hat. He might not have been there physically, but the former president is never far from these debates. This time he was literally up the road, holding his own rally, also weighing in on foreign policy. Israel, Ukraine would have never happened under the Trump administration. I'm the only candidate who can make this promise to you that I will prevent World War III. You're going to have World War III if we're not careful. The former president's likely to spend much of the next year in courtrooms, but with each indictment, his support deepens. Polling suggests Trump is not only trouncing his Republican rivals, he now has a narrow advantage over this man too. The argument he's unelectable has been dismantled. I spoke to a Republican strategist this week who said, only half-joking, that a meteor would have to land on Earth and hit Donald Trump to prevent him from being the Republican nominee. But he is a completely unprecedented candidate. America has never before had a candidate who's a defendant in four criminal cases. It is an extraordinary time. There is a sense in this election cycle that anything could happen. Uh, I found it interesting this evening uh, that these candidates on stage focused their ire mainly on each other, Donald Trump emerging relatively unscathed. I wonder whether when the Republican primary voting begins in earnest in January, they may look back at this debate and others as a missed opportunity. OK, thank you. Now, the government has ordered a public inquiry into the deaths of 27 people in the English Channel two years ago. Let's get more. Uh, Adam is standing by for us. Tell us more, Adam. More now. Yeah, this was two years ago, a tragedy in the Channel where a boat went down as it was carrying people from Dunkirk area towards, uh, towards Britain. At least 27 died, probably 31, because four bodies have never been recovered. Only two people survived. Now, there has been a French report into this. In fact, five people are facing preliminary investigation uh, in France. This report by the British authorities paints a picture of a rather sort of chaotic, overwhelmed response. Uh, it talks of many calls coming in that at one point uh, authorities thought they'd actually rescued the stricken boat, turned out to be a completely different migrant boat. It's made recommendations that there needs to be greater cooperation with the French, that actually there needs to be better uh, surveillance over the channel. That night there was no fixed wing aircraft, that a helicopter had to be scrambled together. But there is no sense of anyone being held culpable and that I think will disappoint many of the families. OK, for now, thank you. Priti Patel giving evidence to the COVID inquiry this morning. Me time, Elena. Um, some concerns uh, legally about the AstraZeneca jab. Yes, they're facing a lawsuit from people who have had those very rare side effects after getting the Oxford AstraZeneca jab. One of them is Jamie Scott. He's a father of two. He had a blood clot uh, that caused him a brain injury after getting his jab. Now, he's already had some compensation from the government, £120,000, but he and his wife say because the brain injury caused by this blood clot, caused by the vaccine, has uh, made him stop work, basically he can't work anymore, that's simply not enough, so he is going to sue the company. Now, another person has also brought a claim, a man whose wife died after getting the first dose of the Oxford AstraZeneca jab and the coroner ruled that she died as a result of very rare complications from the jab. Now, at this point, I think it's important to say that this vaccine has been proven by independent studies to be incredibly effective and incredibly safe. There's been more than 3 billion doses across 180 countries in the world. Scientists say it saved something like 6 million lives, but it's also true to say that in the months after the rollout, scientists did notice that in some very, very rare cases, it could cause blood clots. Something like 1 in 50,000 people under the age of 50 
would get it, one in 100,000 above the age of 50. So that's when um, the UK authorities stopped giving it to people under the age of 40. In fact, it's not actually being used in the UK anymore. Uh, so this case will now seek to find out what the government knew about these side effects, how it handled this case. Uh, it could pave the way for other people who have had these uh, rare blood clots happen to them to also bring claims. Now, for their part, the company has responded to some of these claims, uh, writing to The Telegraph, who published this story originally, saying that patient safety was their highest priority, that the vaccine has continuously been shown to have an acceptable safety profile, and they've consistently stated that the benefits of vaccination outweigh the risk of extremely rare potential side effects. OK, for now, thank you. Thanks very much. Still to come on the programme for you this Thursday morning, the end of the line for train strikes. We'll speak to the rail union boss, Mick Lynch, in just a few moments' time. Half past eight, we'll hear from a charity based in the West Bank as the World Health Organisation warns of the risk of infectious diseases spreading through Gaza. And then at quarter to nine, we'll be joined by a 102-year-old World War veteran. That's Colin Bell. Before that, let me tell you about the UK Foreign Secretary James Cleverly. He's in Saudi in a bid to prevent conflict in the Middle East from escalating. The UK's former ambassador in Lebanon, Tom Fletcher, is with us now. Hi, Tom. It's good to see you. Thanks morning, for joining us on the programme this morning. How worried are you, given um, recent developments and what we're hearing from Hezbollah, etc.? I'm worried. I mean, there's a real risk of escalation. And clearly, all the effort at the moment is on stopping that escalation. And I think actually Blinken and others are making some progress on that. And I think it's good the foreign sector is in Saudi Arabia. The key to ending this conflict is to get the focus back on the two-state solution and back on normalisation, which is this great prize for Israel and the Arab world. From where we're standing this morning, that seems a long way off. It's a long way off. I mean, George Mitchell, the great negotiator, said yeah. 799 days of failure, one day of success. That's the kind of essence of peacemaking and negotiation. The key, I think, right now, we have to be saying to all the parties, stop all violence against all civilians. I'd be backing at the moment having no kill zones and no kill times when civilians can actually move out of these areas. They're getting heavily bombarded and get to safety, get medical supplies, get food and water. And I'd be trying to get more aid, medical supplies, water in uh, using airdrops if necessary. Sounds fabulous. How do you do it? We've worked with harder problems before. You know, we've got a brilliant military, we've got brilliant negotiators. People tell me, that the negotiation teams, people who've done this in similar conflicts, that we've got much more chance of getting those hostages out if we go on the political track, if we work with Qatar, if we work with Turkey, if we work with Egypt, rather than going just on this military track. But um, I speak to the Israeli Defence Force on an almost daily basis and they will have no sucker with uh, not um, firing at a hospital or near a hospital when they assure me that Hamas fighters are underneath in the tunnels. And we've got to be very clear with them on their responsibilities under international law. That has to be unequivocal from the UN, from the Americans, from the Europeans. You know, I was working for Gordon Brown in 2008 when Israel was um, undertaking similar military action in Gaza. And Gordon actually came out quite hard quite early with David Miliband as Foreign Secretary to call for a ceasefire. And at the time, everyone said, Israel will never follow this. They won't listen. A week later, there was a ceasefire. Netanyahu has said why he won't uh, agree to a ceasefire at the moment, and that is because he feels that it will give Hamas the opportunity to refuel and rearm. There's a danger, but we've got to get together some sort of contact group. We've got to work with the Egyptians, we've got to work with the Qataris, we've got to work with all the regional powers to basically help a new Palestinian leadership emerge. The more moderate Palestinian leadership, as there is in the West Bank, reassert control in Gaza. But that, that takes politics, it takes diplomacy, it takes negotiation. You can't bomb that outcome. A lot of people that I've been chatting to um, over the last month have asked, 7th of October, why now? Why did Hamas do what they did on that fateful day? It was a grim day and it's, you know, it's hard to believe it's a month ago. Those awful, awful pictures, I mean, the horrors of that day. I think they did it because they wanted to try and kill off this process of normalisation. Israel was, and we heard it from Mohammed bin Salman, the, the Saudi king, probably within a month, I think, of a, of a peace deal with the Saudis, with the rest of the region. I mean, There's the rub, isn't it? It's about the Saudis, yeah. And it's all about breaking that, stopping that happening. And so I would say to the Israelis and the Saudis and others in the region, you know, let's get back to that real price. Don't give Hamas, Iran, the Israeli hard right, this chance to kill off that peace process and kill off the two-state mm. solution. 
Netanyahu um, re replying to um, the Deputy Secretary General of Hezbollah speaking to our sister outlet NBC, and he uh, was saying um, complete confrontation uh, if necessary or as necessary. Um, he's basically, Netanyahu was saying in response, you know what, stay in your lane or I'm coming for you guys as well. Can Israel afford to fight on two fronts? I think it'd be devastating for Israel. It'd be devastating for the region. It'd be devastating for Lebanon, the country in which I served. The Lebanese people don't want that. I don't think the Israeli people want that. We've got to get the focus on getting these hostages back, which takes politics, takes negotiation, Are you still and stopping confident? these attacks on civilians. Are you still confident? Yeah, I am. I mean, we've been in situations like this before where we've managed to get hostages out, but you've got to find a way to talk. You've got to find a way to make the politics work. And everyone I know who's involved with those discussions, including special, force, special forces leaders and others, think that it's the politics that will get the results and not the military operation. Um, we are seeing... Uh, a child in Gaza killed every 10 minutes, I believe, is, is the latest figures. Um, up to 11,000 people have been killed already, pushing um, almost a half of them are youngsters. Every time that happens, surely that makes the tension that is the tinderbox in the Middle East even worse. It makes it much, much harder, much, much harder to get back to some kind of trust, to rebuild that confidence you need for, for two peoples to share the same land. But ultimately, there are three ways to settle this. Either we, we leave it to God to sort out, as many in the region would like to do, or we fight it out, in which case the stronger side will win and the weaker side will make them not enjoy it forevermore, or we share that land. We find a way to share that land and we get back to a peace process. I, I spent some time recently with um, a Palestinian doctor who had lost three daughters oh. to a previous Israeli attack. Uh, I mean, how can you, you can imagine interviewing someone like that? Just an awful situation. And at the end, I was the one who was struggling to find the words to describe them, that moment. And he said, ultimately, the courage is you've got to forgive. You've got to find a way to move on. That's the only way that we're going to move forward as a region, as two peoples. Netanyahu you know, does right. not forgive what happened on the 7th of October. He says he has the full support of his country in obliterating Hamas. If that is to happen, and he's certainly hell-bent on doing that at the moment, who would run Gaza? Who could run Gaza? Those are pretty chilling words. Uh, I don't know whether Netanyahu will be around for the medium to longer term as the Israeli leader. I'm not sure he has the full support of his country in that sort of bellicose, belligerent language. Look, there's a very ageing Palestinian leadership in the West Bank who have had lots of struggles with governing even their bit of the territory, let alone Gaza. But every society has moderate, new, fresh leadership that can come through. And I believe that's the case for the Palestinians as well. There are lots of people who could be taking over. What's the end game? It has to be two-state solution. It has to be two, two, two states sharing this same land. There's no other way of, of doing that. And we got close, you know, in, in 2008. 90s, yeah, and, well. and, and again, yeah, I mean, under Clinton, you know, Gordon Brown, that period when I worked in number 10 for Gordon Brown, he was actually getting the maps out between the Israelis and the Saudis and really close to agreeing what that could actually look like. Maybe in the midst of all of this, one, and it's glib to talk about bright spots, but maybe it will remind people of why we've got to re-engage and get that two-state solution. Finally, we do have skin in the game. Historically, we are, you know, in some part responsible for the situation now. Um, do we still have um, any um, recognition of being a, a, a country that can help with a solution? You're right to, to mention the historical baggage. And, you know, whenever I used to go and visit schools in the region, the first question was always about the Sykes-Picot Agreement, the Balfour Declaration, these moments in the UK's history that people in the region blame for the situation they're now in, that sense that we were just kind of carving lines across the map. Some justification. Dividing yeah. people from their families and their homes and communities. So we do have baggage, but we are a UN Security Council member. We're seen classically as more neutral than the Russians or the Americans on this issue. And we can work with the French, we can work with our Arab partners. We do have good relationships in Israel. So we, there is a role for us to play. What I would hesitate, you know, the, the line I don't like is when we say we are leading the global response. We're not leading the response. We're a key player and we can use our diplomatic skills, our military skills, our great strengths in aid and development to be a player. But we're one player among many. OK, Mr Ambassador, it's always great to see you. Thanks for joining us Thank on you. the programme. Thank you. Um, domestic matters via the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly. The weather.
Sponsored by Qatar Airways. Back to sunshine and showers today, turning drier into the weekend. Expect more rain on Sunday. Quite chilly now, windy with heavy showers in the west and far southeast, but much of the east is fine. Sunny spells, further showers this morning, with thundery downpours likely, but many eastern parts look like staying dry. It's going to be colder than recently and windy in the south. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Now, these uh, animals might be considered to be cute and cuddly, but they represent a lot more on the world stage. After more than two decades at a zoo in Washington, a family of giant pandas have been flown home to China. Mi Zhang and Chan Chan, along with their three-year-old cub, boarded the aptly named FedEx Panda Express en route to a reserve in Chengdu. The US first welcomed pandas from China back in 1972, a show of good relations between the two countries. But with the state's only remaining pandas set to leave Atlanta next year, there's speculation that diplomatic tensions between Beijing and the West could prevent the bears from being loaned out in the future. In other words, they're not going to pander to us. Coming up, we'll get the view on it. We'll get the view of the Transport Secretary on Suella Braverman's comments accusing the Met Police of being soft on left-wing protests. Could there soon be an end to the rail strike? Chatting to Mitnick. Must be officially Christmas. The John Lewis ad is out. Well, I mean, this has been an issue um, for some time um, and it always gets worse around winter, which is the, classically the time that every year NHS services are under a lot more pressure. Um, and we're finding patients are opting to go privately for their for their health care um, because it's quicker and, and they feel they'll, they'll get a more prompt service. I think what's happening is um, things like on the day GP services or going to clinics locally that you can pay for. People are choosing to do that because often the wait for their GP can be, be a bit longer. Um, I think the, it does free up appointments probably, but I think what's would be better if we had an inclusive NHS system where everyone could be seen in time. We, you, we, in my practice, we have a triage system, so often the most serious people get seen on the day or quicker if, um, within the hour if we feel that they need to be seen. Um, for the more routine things, that's where people tend to struggle a little bit more. So um, it could be two weeks before they see a routine. Wow. Yeah, and that's a problem, which is why you're often seeing the routine things going to the private sector. Now, it's really important that people actually, if they're in the vulnerable groups get the COVID and the flu vaccines. Often there are extra services put in place because it's such an important thing because reducing the amount of people getting those um, illnesses actually takes pressure off the NHS. So there is a lot of push to getting people done and um, getting these on the weekends or in their local pharmacy, places which are more accessible. <laughs> Stage, the film and TV podcast.
OK, look who is uh, here. The Transport Secretary, Mark Harper, want to talk about the RMT union in just a second. But first, my goodness me, what on earth is Suella Braverman up to, suggesting that the Met Police are biased? Well, look, what we're all doing in government, and I was at a meeting with the Home Secretary, two meetings this week, actually, where we were entirely focused, uh, a number of ministers and those from range of the policing family, the Met Commissioner and other police leaders, all focused on making sure that, particularly this weekend, with the important Armistice Day on Saturday and Remembrance Sunday, that, those, uh, that the protest takes place peacefully and that all those that wish to travel to London uh, for the Armistice and Remembrance Sunday events feel that they can do so with confidence. That's what the police are, are focused on doing. That's why the Prime Minister had the Commissioner in yesterday to ask the Commissioner for important assurances about what the Met's doing to protect those Remembrance events and to make sure that the protest passes off peacefully. That's what we're all focused on doing within government. Are the Met Police biased? Well, look, I think the Met Police have focused, uh, as I've seen them, them this week, on focused on keeping people safe at the weekend. They're putting in place measures uh, across the board to make sure that the march, pro uh, the protest takes place peacefully, that people obey the law, um, and that other members of the community can go about their lawful business without being uh, intimidated or frightened. And that's what they're focused on doing. And that's not just the Met, that's, that's other police forces. I have the ministerial responsibility for the British Transport Police, which polices our railway uh, system and our transport network. And we want to make them to use their full legal powers to make sure people can be free of, of intimidation. And we don't see the scenes that we saw uh, previously where people were, were concerned about using railway stations. Do they do that in a biased way? They do that in a very responsible way. Is it biased? They do that in a very responsible way, focused on biased? obeying focused on obeying the law. The police, so she's wrong to say that. The police it? are focused on implementing on the, the focus on keeping people safe and implementing the law using the full force of the law, which, by the way, we strengthened this year in the Public Order Act to give them more tools to keep people safe, and that's I know. what they're focused on. I know. She's, uh, the uh, Home Secretary says there are double standards between left and right-wing groups. Do you think they are? I, I think the police are focused on policing to keep people safe, and that, those were the assurances the Prime Minister but asked the Commissioner for. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous for her to say this sort of thing. Well, Is she trying to get sacked? But the Prime Minister focused yesterday, when he had the Commissioner in, on the substance of this issue, which is to check that with the Commissioner that the police have put everything in place to keep the Armistice and Remembrance events uh, protected, which the Commissioner assured him that he had, and that they had all of the measures in place to make sure that the protests, when they take place, okay. do so safely. It's worth remembering, Kay, that, you know, Britons and Israelis can do these protests and can have express a whole range of opinions. Hamas wouldn't let these protests take place, and that's the difference between living in a free society uh, and being would ruled you say, by terrorists. Would you say what she said in the article in The Times this morning? Well, look, what we've all been doing in government is focusing on the substance, which is about... Why don't you want to answer my question? Which is about... Well, no, I'm answering your question. I'm just answering it <laughs> in, my, it's a... in my way. Look, I've been sat in a number of meetings this week with senior ministers, including the okay. Home Secretary and police leaders and those from our intelligence community are all focused on making sure that there's no disorder this weekend and that people are able to go about their lawful business okay, you and protest the Prime peacefully. Minister. You mentioned the Prime Minister um, <clears throat> and um, him calling in to Mark Rowley, the Commissioner, uh, yesterday. He said that Mark Rowley will be accountable for his decision for this uh, march to go ahead. What does accountable mean? Does that mean if it goes badly, he'll get sacked? Well, look, I, look it, the legal position is very clear on this. The, the right to seek an order to prohibit a protest is an operational decision for the Metropolitan exactly. Police Commissioner. Many people have suggested that he should have used that. He said yesterday that he didn't think the legal test had been met, that there would be a risk of serious what disorder. Do you think? So, well, that's, look, that's an operational decision for the Commissioner, and, and I think that's for him what the Prime Minister wanted to do. And it is the job of, in a democratic country, for the police to make those operational decisions, but it is ultimately for politicians to hold them to account. That's what the Prime Minister was doing yesterday. Okay. He wanted to seek assurances from the Commissioner okay. that the police had put every measure possible in place to make sure that the protest takes place peacefully okay. within the law and that the rest well, of the community feels safe. Well, let me put it this way, safe. if I may, please, uh, Secretary of State. Whose fault will it be if trouble breaks out? The Home Secretary says it'll be the fault of the police. Well, the police are focused on making sure that there isn't trouble and that the, law, and that the law is enforced. And, and I'd also say, look, the government's been clear that although the people have a right to protest, 
protesting on Armistice Day is disrespectful, uh, we think, to those that made the ultimate sacrifice okay. that we're remembering and that it shouldn't take place. But people have the right to protest and the police need to make sure that the march passes off peacefully. They've got more legal powers to do so following the okay. strengthening of the Public Order Act. And the Prime Minister was holding to the Commissioner to account yesterday to make sure they're going to use those powers. Two other things. The RMT union um, uh, is voting, um, well, asking their members whether they want to accept a 9% uh, deal over two years. Uh, mutually agreed. We'll be speaking to uh, the leader of the RMT very shortly. Um, were you involved in sorting this out? Well, look, I I've been on your programme before and you've asked me this question. There is a deal on the table. It's been on the table for quite a long time, this deal. And I think I've said to you on previous occasions that I wanted the RMT to put the deal to their members, to give their members the chance to express a view on it. I'm very pleased that the train operating companies and the RMT were able to issue a joint statement yesterday saying they'd reached agreement and that the RMT is going to ask their members to express a view. When they did on Network Rail, their members voted overwhelmingly to accept it. That's what I hope they do, so that they can get a pay rise, uh, we can get on with then focusing on getting more people back sure. on the railways to deal with its financial sustainability post-pandemic. Sounds as though, from what you're saying, the, the uh, union's folded, but let's see what our RMT uh, leader says when he comes on. Uh, I know you want to talk about uh, vehicles, driverless vehicles, um, <laughs> self-driving vehicles. You were in one the other day, weren't you? I was yesterday, yes. I was driven around Westminster in one by a fantastic uh, British company called Wave. OK. And if one of those vehicles is in an accident while you've not got your hands mm -hmm. on the wheel, you're not responsible for what might happen? No, so what we're doing, so the legislation that we've announced in the King's speech will set out a very a robust legal framework to make it clear who's responsible, and so what we'll be doing is if the car's in full self-driving mode, the driver, obviously, the, the passenger won't be responsible, it'll be the company that's developed that technology, and we're going to set out a framework of how that will work. And by giving companies that regulatory certainty, it makes Britain the best place in the world for companies to develop that technology. The important thing for people at home sir, to remember is, actually, this is about how you improve road safety. Um, the overwhelming majority of accidents that take place have some level of driver uh, human error involved in them. We can actually make roads safer, not just for drivers, but also for vulnerable road users, for pedestrians and for cyclists. And all the companies involved in this are absolutely focused on safety. There's a big economic win here, is if companies develop this technology in Britain, then we'll create a huge number of jobs and lots of economic growth, which will be uh, of, you know, very promising. We're a leading player in this area. Okay. That's why the Prime Minister was very keen to introduce this legislation and we're going to take it through Parliament as fast as we can. We're out of time, but I know you'll want to comment on this. I see you wearing your poppy with pride. The Sun saying this morning that poppy stalls, we don't see them at train stations, not least because of 78-year-old Jim Henderson, who was kicked and punched when he was trying to sell poppies the other day. Well, look, I saw that story and it's terrible and that's why the British Transport Police are focused on keeping people safe using our rail network. Rail stations are not places where people should be protesting. They're places where people should be going to use the that transport business, network. Yeah. The BTP are focused on keeping those stations free of protests so that people can sell poppies in confidence but also use the rail network. Importantly, this weekend, veterans can get to those remembrance services free of charge and I want them to have the confidence to travel safely on the rail network. And that's what the British Transport Police is focused on doing. Good to see you. Thanks Pleasure. for joining us on the programme. Thank you. Uh, let's have a look what the papers are saying. As I said, that was on the front of The Sun. This is The Times reporting that the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, has accused the Met Police of playing favourites by refusing to ban Saturday's pro-Palestinian march in London, which coincides with Armistice Day. On your head, be it. The Mail leads on Rishi Sunak's meeting with Met Commissioner Sir Mark Rowley. Meanwhile, The Guardian reporting that Sakir Starmer is fighting to keep control of the Labour Party over his stance on the conflict. As promised, Mick Lynch is here. Hiya. Good morning. Um, Mick, uh, Mark Harper, Transport Secretary, uh, rather suggesting that you guys have folded and um, after you could have accepted this deal 9% over two years some time ago. Well, we haven't got 9% over two years, Kay. That's, what have you got? We haven't got a two-year deal. We've got a single-year uh, deal at 5% or with an underpin of 1750. What Mark Harper didn't say is that his plans to shut every ticket office has collapsed. He had to reverse that and do a U-turn a week ago. And now he's made an unconditional offer. The offers we had uh, over the last 18 months have all been conditional. We had to accept the chopping up of our contracts of employment, 
driver-only operation, extension of working hours, and all sorts of matters that have been taken off the table. So we've now got an unconditional deal. We've got a job security agreement that runs through to next year, something that the media were saying would never happen. And we've got a, a, a proposal that we can put to our members. The campaign will go on because all of these issues will be deferred into the spring. We'll probably have six months where there's no need for industrial action because they're not going to impose these changes. So the government has backed down on its agenda. They said we would only get a pay rise if we accepted all of these cuts and all these attacks. We've defended our railways pension scheme. There'll be no changes to that, which they were seeking to cut billions out of. So we haven't given way on anything. We've got a straightforward pay deal with a job security agreement, which we're putting to our members, and then we'll go into a process to discuss the changes the companies are seeking. And will you make a recommendation? No, because it's a below inflation pay offer. It's very modest. So there's nobody popping champagne corks at our headquarters. Our members will consider it. They'll get a considerable amount of back pay if they want to accept it. If they don't accept it, we will continue with our campaign as it is at the moment. If they do accept it, then we go into the spring and see what the companies bring forward. But we will have the option to seek more industrial action mandates if that's necessary. Do you think they will accept it? I don't know. We'll have to see. They've only got the news last night at uh, four or five o'clock. We'll be getting the information out to them. We'll give them all the documentation and then they'll make their decision. We'll clarify it and explain what it all means and they'll make their decision. Would you accept it? Well, I don't get a vote. And my, but if you were one of your members... Well, my position is I have to put the union's position, which is it's a neutral referendum. They will make their decision. So I'm not able to make a recommendation on that, on that offer. It sounds, though, from what you're saying, that you don't think it's a great offer. It's not a great offer. Nobody's going to pretend it is. It's below inflation. Our members haven't had a pay rise for four years. This is one instalment on a, a pay proposal from two years ago. Uh, we haven't done this year's pay and we should be doing next year's pay soon. So our campaigns to get our members a decent pay rise and to protect their terms and conditions will continue even during this referendum and we'll hold our position in the new year that we will not accept uh, the imposition of changes on our contracts. When will you know what the members think? At the end of November, on the 30th of November, the ballot will be returned. OK. Um, Christmas strikes, yes or no? Likely, not likely? Well, if our members accept these proposals, there'll be no need for strikes. If they don't accept them, if they reject it, then that option is available. Mm, so Christmas strikes are still on the cards, depends well, on what your members say. We haven't got any strikes planned. We haven't uh, named any strikes and we'll review what happens after the result comes in. OK, it's good to see you. Thanks for joining us this morning, Mick. Thank you. Thank you. Still to come on the programme for you, we're going to be speaking to a former chief superintendent of the Met as the Home Secretary accuses the force of playing favourites over planned pro-Palestinian protests at the weekend. I wonder what he's going to say. I'm Martha Kellner and I'm Sky's US correspondent based here in Los Angeles. It's turning everybody into, you know, a crazy, violent drug addict. How are you feeling? You feel I am angry. It is an anti-woman agenda. Two women say that you paid for their abortions. Are you a hypocrite, sir? Will your candidates win? I hope so. I think they will. I think they're great candidates. I gotta be realistic. My sister's dead. More than four weeks on, there's no murder weapon and no suspect. Are you going to catch this killer? We are doing everything we can. Ghislaine Maxwell has pleaded not guilty to all six charges against her. Mum, how are you feeling today? Jeffrey said, you answer to Ghislaine, you just don't cross her. I'm so excited. Severe nightmares of these people coming in and just taking me in the middle of the night. I've watched as whole towns were torn apart by natural disaster. I'm alive and I'm thankful for that, but there are a lot of people who aren't. It's not the winds people fear most here, it's the water. We take you to the heart of the stories which shape our world. Do you truly believe what you're saying? A lot of cases that I know are reported from Ukrainian missiles themselves. A ambassador, with respect, I think that's preposterous. <laughs>
Hello again, everybody. You're watching The Breakfast Show. If you've only just joined us, you've missed Mick Whelan and Mark Harper literally crossing in the studio. Uh, tell you what they had to say uh, coming up. But first, the Home Secretary, Suella Bravman, accusing London's Met Police of double standards in their approach to pro-Palestinian protests. Um, Dal Babu, former Chief Superintendent with the Met, is with us. Hi, good to see you. Thanks for joining us on the programme. Um, good morning, biased, Kate. Bias the Met, we hear. I, mean, I, I can't believe what I'm hearing, Kay. This is unprecedented. Uh, we have a situation where somebody occupying one of the great state offices is in a public spat with the police commissioner. The operational decisions are made by the police, have always will be, always will, always should be. It's about gathering the intelligence and basing, based on intelligence, making a decision on what they should be doing. Uh, the politicians don't have access to that intelligence. They don't understand public order tactics. They don't know, don't understand what can be done and what can't be done. And the governance is very, very clear. And it has been clear for many decades. And in fact, on one occasion, have the, we, in my history, have the police stopped a demonstration, which was in 2011. It was the English Defence League who were trying to march past a mosque in Tower Hamlet. All the other occasions when we've seen marches, demonstrations, some will have significant amounts of... Uh, problems and challenges, they've all been allowed to go ahead. And we, we are not Russia, we, we are not China, we're not Iran. Um, we, we need to ensure that we facilitate demonstrations that are lawful and, and deal with individuals that break the law. Uh, Prime Minister's got involved as well. He's basically said, uh, we're guessing that he said cancel it, uh, this protest on Armistice Day. Uh, by the pro-Palestinian movement. And um, the Met chief has said, can't, it doesn't meet the criteria to cancel. Um, the Prime Minister has said in response, I'm paraphrasing, on your head be it. Um, is that a reasonable approach by the Prime Minister? No, again, it, 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 it's, it's unprecedented. Uh, I mean, Sir Mark Rowley is, has shown an uh, extraordinary level of bravery. He's gone in there and said, look, this is, this is what I know, this is the intelligence and this is what I will be doing. Even if he did uh, roll over and agree to the march being uh, banned, it would then go to court and there'd be a judicial review uh, and you'd have to put forward all the evidence. And the evidence has been over the last uh, month, there's been uh, numerous marches, sometimes with 150,000 people. There's been very little disorder, very, very minimal levels of uh, uh, arrest, much less than you would expect in, a, in other events of this size. Uh, and then the decision would have been overturned. So, you know, I, I think Sir Mark Rowley needs to be given credit for being extraordinarily brave and um, dealing with policing as he should be. And it's clear that we understand the governments. The police do the operational policing. The politicians make rules and policies and, uh, and, what, and, and the strategy. Uh, but it's a police who deliver operational policing. That should not change. Otherwise, it becomes, you know, directions to the police to arrest individuals, to allow this march and ban that one. And it becomes incredibly political. Uh, and, and quite frankly, Kay, what is going to happen is, you know, there, there is now, I'm sure, going to be right wing groups who are going to turn up who have been emboldened by what the Home Secretary says. And it makes the life of uh, police officers much more difficult. Although Stella Bravman saying right wing uh, protesters are dealt with um, severely, whereas left wing um, demonstrators are not. Well, it's not been my experience. When I was borough commander, we allowed the English Defence League to march in uh, during Ramadan uh, past a, a mosque. Uh, so, so that's certainly my, not my experience. Um, and I think the other thing I'd, I'd just like to say, Kay, so some of the things that Suala Bradman is saying as a as a, a, a brown woman um, would would not be tolerated if it was said by a white man, a white woman. You know, some of the things she said about uh, Pakistani men, some of the things she's saying about hate marches. You know, I, I'm, I'm just flabbergasted by some of the conversations and some of the comments that she's making. I hope we take the heat out of this. I hope we listen to what Sir Mark Rowley says, who's a, a police officer with extraordinary levels of uh, experience, and, and we let the police get, to get on with what they're doing, which is um, policing and making London safe. Uh, we shouldn't be making the job of the police more difficult. Um, thanks for your expertise. Let's see what happens at the weekend. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Kate. All the best. Take care. Good look at the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Well, we're back 
to uh, sunshine and showers today and it'll turn drier into the weekend but expected more rain on Sunday. It's quietly chilly now and windy with heavy showers in the west and far southeast, but much of the east is fine. There'll be sunny spells and further showers this morning with thundery downpours likely, but many eastern parts look like staying dry. It's going to be colder than recently and windy in the south with gales returning to southwest coasts and also hills. The Weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Coming up in just a few moments' time, we uh, are reflecting on an article in the Times newspaper today where the uh, Home Secretary, remember that the police report to the Home Secretary, the Home Secretary has said that the Metropolitan Police is showing bias, playing favourites and making comparisons with demonstrations in Northern Ireland. What a row it's created. Morning everybody, it's 8 o'clock. Very welcome to join us on The Breakfast Show. The sun might be shining, but there's an escalating row this morning over accusations from the Home Secretary that the police are playing favourites with protesters. The Transport Secretary refused to repeat that allegation. Labour says Suella Braverman is out of control. We'll hear their view on pro-Palestinian marches coming up shortly. Thursday, the 9th of November. A government source has branded the Home Secretary ignorant after she says hate marches are what we are more used to seeing 
in Northern Ireland. A former chief superintendent had this to say. And so some of the things that Suella Bradman is saying as a, as a, a, a brown woman um, would, would not be tolerated if it was said by a white man, a white woman. A poll for Sky News finds half of Britons think Saturday's Armistice Day march by pro-Palestinian protesters should be banned. As the death toll rises in Gaza, there are reports of a possible humanitarian pause, a three-day ceasefire. Also ahead, the government orders an independent inquiry into the deaths of 27 people in the English Channel in 2021. Making tech safer, Ofcom unveils new rules to protect children online. The end of Panda diplomacy. Three of the giant bears on loan from China to the US are shipped home. And Guessed it, it's the John Lewis Christmas ad. <laughs> Home Secretary has accused the Metropolitan Police of playing favourites with protesters. Swella Bravman claimed that senior officers are biased and employed a double standard towards pro-Palestinian marches compared to right-wing protesters. Former Met Superintendent Dal Babu told us just a few moments ago he couldn't believe what he was hearing. Writing in The Times, she said, I do not believe that these marches are merely a cry for help for Gaza. They are an assertion of primacy by certain groups, particularly Islamists, of the kind we are more used to seeing in Northern Ireland. Also disturbingly reminiscent of Ulster are the reports that some of Saturday's March group organisers have links to terrorist groups, including Hamas. She went on, unfortunately there is a perception that senior police officers play favourites when it comes to protesters. Right-wing and nationalist protesters who engage in aggression are rightly met with a stern response Yet pro-Palestinian mobs displaying almost identical behaviour are largely ignored, even when clearly breaking the law. This is what the former Met Superintendent Dal Babu had to say. And so some of the things that Suala Bradman is saying as a, as a, a, a brown woman um, would, would not be tolerated if it was said by a white man, a white woman. You know, some of the things she said about uh, Pakistani men, some of the things she's saying about hate marches, you know, I, I'm, I'm just flabbergasted by some of the conversations and some of the comments that she's making. I hope we take the heat out of this. I hope we listen to what Sir Mark Rowley says, who's a, a police officer with extraordinary levels of uh, experience, and, and we let the police get, to get on with what they're doing, which is um, policing and making London safe. Uh, we shouldn't be making the job of the police more difficult. <laughs> I don't know what Speechless to say, there. Mary. I don't know Speechless. what to say. And the minister sat there and he wouldn't condemn her. He wouldn't condemn her, but he also wouldn't use support those her. words. Yeah. He wouldn't support her. Yeah. And that's also what we're hearing from Number 10, trying to get something out of Number 10 about whether Sunak signed off on that op-ed or not. They won't tell us either way, which I think... At some point, he is going to have to confirm whether or not he did sign off on this op-ed. He will be asked again and again and again until somebody finds an answer. And I think depending on whether Sunak did support this op-ed or did not support this op-ed, that will be indicative of, therefore, his position, whether he thinks it's appropriate to use language like that and to pit those different communities, the protesting communities that she talks about, uh, off each other. So uh, it's a really extraordinary intervention from a Home Secretary, to be honest. I mean... She is a divisive character anyway. That's part Nothing of her branding. That. Yeah, that's part of her branding at the end of the day. Home Secretary is a very divisive and difficult job. Uh, and obviously you need to be robust in your language sometimes. I'm Home Secretary, I don't think anybody denies that. But I think Mark Carper was clearly very uncomfortable when you continue to ask him over and over again whether he supported that language. And he just, he was, you know, squirming almost on the sofa because he couldn't actually say the words, yes, I support that. And that, I think, speaks volumes, the fact that he couldn't say that.
Now, the reaction from Tories, I mean, one Tory MP I spoke to this morning said it's absolutely a leadership pitch that he, they don't think that she would actually ever win uh, and that essentially she's trying to get more and more attention uh, by a kind of Certainly headline got that grabbing. This absolutely. And another really senior government source actually told Sky News last night that it was wholly offensive and ignorant of where people in Northern Ireland stand on the issues of Israel and Gaza. And they went on to say it's clear that the Home Secretary is only looking after her misguided aspirations for leader rather than responsible leadership as a Home Secretary. Now, Labour have said she's out of control. Some would say, well, Labour would say that they're in opposition. But I think, nonetheless, people at home might be wondering, is that kind of rhetoric what we can see for the future? If she stays in posi position, if she stays in post, are we going to see more and more of this type of inflammatory language ahead of a general election to try and essentially win over the right of the party? I think there are some nerves within the Tory party. They could lose votes to reform, for instance. Sure. David's with us, actually, in Belfast. David, I'm going to have to put my glasses on for this. Um, the Home Secretary compared what she called hate marches to sectarian parades in Northern Ireland. How many people is she offended by saying that? Uh, a huge number. I'm rarely lost for words, but I was last night when I read this op-ed for the first time. Uh, we've got one former cabinet minister describing it as ignorant and offensive. Many people here will describe it also as dangerous, given the context of Northern Ireland. And let me explain why. It is Protestant loyal orders who are responsible for the vast, vast majority of marches in Northern Ireland. These are people who would be natural allies of the Home Secretary's Conservative and Unionist Party. They are pro-union, pro-Brexit, pro-Israel, everything that she stands for. So she will have offended people who would be her natural allies. Equally, it's offensive to them because they claim to be marching in defence of the Protestant faith. In in other words, Christianity. So they will not take kindly to being likened to those who march in defence of Islam. Equally, if she was in some kind of clumsy way referring to Catholic civil rights marchers from the late 60s and 70s, has she forgotten Bloody Sunday when 14 innocent civilians were shot dead by the British Army during a civil rights march? But it's dangerous because Northern Ireland is currently without a power-sharing government. And when there is a political vacuum, this kind of inflammatory language does nothing to stabilise the fragile peace. You know, I would be tempted to suggest this government is trying to persuade unionists that devolution is a better option than direct rule, but that would require a level of strategic thinking on Northern Ireland we've not seen for a long time. <laughs> Elegantly put, David. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, we don't know whether the Prime Minister signed off on that speech. We'll have to, uh, that um, op-ed um, in the paper, we'll have to wait and find out. Tom is here. What does the British public think about marches at the weekend? Well, we've asked them. This is exactly the question. We put them, 2,000 people have polled done by YouGov for us. And despite everything we've been talking about today, this language and the op-ed, the fundamental question that Suella Braverman sort of believes this march shouldn't happen the public agrees with her, and they agree by a very large majority. It's actually a clear majority, 50% of people think this march on Saturday, on Armistice Day, shouldn't go ahead. They think it should be banned. So, you know, those authoritarian tendencies that might have been criticised actually seem like they're shared by most of the public. And this, this is sort of one of the rare things in this Israel-Hamas conflict in terms of public perception where people seem to be fairly agreed upon. Because if you look at other bits of this, it, it's pretty divisive across age group, across party. We ask people which side do they agree with more in this war, Israel or Palestine. Uh, and you have this sort of fairly entrenched support, the Palestinian side, the Israeli side. You can see those two on the bottom. They haven't really changed. It's about 20% of people supporting each. Where there has been a change is people going from, I don't know about this conflict back in May, to supporting both sides equally. So there is, so that is the majority opinion, but that stubbornness of support, and it does break down younger people and people who vote Labour tend to support the Palestinian side, uh, older voters, Conservative voters on the Israeli side. And then the other thing we asked about is because there's been such a lobster, uh, lobster amongst the political leaders, um, Prime Minister, Leader of Opposition, about supporting Israel in its actions and what um, they think they should be doing in terms of a humanitarian pause. Um, here we go. Um, most people think the UK should oppose Israel's actions and push for them to call a ceasefire. That's the most popular option. And then you've got support Israel's military actions, but call for a temporary ceasefire. That's closer to the government position. So again, the public going further, really, than the leaders want to, and especially if you drill into that again in terms of the Labour vote, 
Labour voters are a lot more likely to oppose Israel's actions. They're a lot further away from Keir Starmer. So this is a very, very divisive issue, but it comes back to that march on Saturday. Most people in this country think that march should be banned. OK, uh, for now. Uh, ceasefire, humanitarian pause. How likely is it? Uh, Cordelia standing by for us this morning in Jerusalem. Uh, what is the latest from there, Cordelia? There are reports that there are delicate negotiations going on. As we understand it, the Egyptians, the Qataris and the Americans have got together and that there are discussions going on about the possible release of potentially a dozen hostages uh, in exchange for a temporary three-day ceasefire. Uh, now, there is no official confirmation on this. Hamas has said it is willing to release 12 hostages, uh, but it says it's unable to currently because of the continued US airstrikes. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu has so far been reticent, uh, rejecting calls uh, for uh, these humanitarian pauses, which the international community have been asking for. Uh, but there is a sense that we are moving closer to a possible pause uh, in the next few days. That would allow, Kay, critical aid to get delivered and fuel uh, as well. There is a mounting uh, death toll uh, within Gaza and we've seen very dramatic images continue to play out from there. Uh, we will have to see. It is a, a real game of trust building and there's a pretty big trust deficit at the moment. Cordelia, thank you. A lot of trust deficits as far as the railways were concerned for some considerable time. The RIT, RMT rather saying now, though, that it's uh, reached a deal with train operators that could bring their long-running dispute to an end. Earlier, the Transport Secretary told me he hopes members of the rail union will accept the pay deal. The union leader says they haven't backed down. That I wanted the RMT to put the deal to their members to give their members the chance to express a view on it. I'm very pleased that the train operating companies and the RMT were able to issue a joint statement yesterday saying they'd reached agreement and that the RMT is going to ask their members to express a view. When they did on Network Rail, their members voted overwhelmingly to accept it. That's what I hope they do so that they can get a pay rise, uh, we can get on with then focusing on getting more people back sure. on the railways to deal with its financial sustainability post-pandemic. Sounds as though, from what you're saying, the, the uh, union's folded, but let's see what RMT uh, leader says when he comes on. The government has backed down on its agenda. They said we would only get a pay rise if we accepted all of these cuts and all these attacks. We've defended our railways pension scheme. There'll be no changes to that, which they were seeking to cut billions out of. So we haven't given way on anything. We've got a straightforward pay deal with a job security agreement, which we're putting to our members, and then we'll go into a process to discuss the changes the companies are seeking. Other news for you now. Um, Ofcom, uh, let's tell you about them. They've published uh, first guidelines to tackle illegal content online. The regulator has told social media platforms to exclude children from suggested friends lists, preventing children from becoming friends with or messaging unrelated people. US Actors Union has agreed to what it says is a tentative deal with Hollywood studio bosses to end its 118-day strike. The dispute has delayed films including Disney's Lilo and Stitch and the latest Paddington movie. Oof. And blood tests to help detect early Alzheimer's could be available on the NHS in the next five years. UK's leading dementia charities are funding a £5 million study to help bring tests into clinical use. Scientists say it would be cheaper than current methods and allow patients to be diagnosed sooner. Shadow Business and Trade Secretary in the form of Jonathan Reynolds is here this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Where do we start well, with the Home Secretary? What is that about? Uh, it's just genuinely out of control. But it's, it's irresponsible, it's divisive, and fundamentally, it's so obvious what is going on here. This is a person who is completely driven by their own agenda, their own ambition. We know that. It's not a surprise there, as you say. But where is the Prime Minister in this? Do we believe the Prime Minister signed off that kind of inflammatory rhetoric? We don't know. We've we asked. Well, he won't tell us. But why is he really too weak to sack 
is Home Secretary? I mean, that's the question we've got to ask. And I'll just say, look, in all of this, this is, this is a difficult time in lots of different ways. Surely the job of Home Secretary, the, the job of protecting the public, is one that demands respect, public service, not undermining the police they've got enough on, not undermining their operational independence. I just cannot believe... And we have to find out today from the Prime Minister, did he sign off, did he agree to this? And if not, is he too weak to sack her? Well, good with that. Good luck with that, rather, because we have been trying. Um, but, you know, in all seriousness, perception is reality. She does, uh, her views, uh, mirror quite a lot of the British public. Well, I would disagree with that. I don't think there's any substance to Suella Bravman other than her own ambition. I think she'd trample over any principle or person in, in the pursuit of her own ambitions. But I think, you know, if we look specifically what we're talking about this weekend. I mean, look, for me, Remembrance Sunday, the activities of this weekend are sacrosanct. You know, I will be leading in Hyde and Staley Bridge, which I represent, our Remembrance Services. I'll be, we'll be at a parade, we have our brass bands there. It's a hugely important part of what we do. But of course, where the police say they can manage other activity in a way which will not interfere in those incredibly important services and activities, surely you've got to respect the operational independence of the police. They've got enough to do. It's a difficult job. Rather than undermine them, particularly if you are the Home Secretary. So I think she's got this wrong and she needs to maybe reflect on her own behaviour. Here's a tricky one for you. We've just had Dal Babu, I don't know if you heard him, former Chief Superintendent with the Met Police on the programme. He says she gets away with stuff because she's a brown woman and if she was a white woman or a white man, she wouldn't. Well, look, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to get into that. I think you judge everyone on what they've said, their own behaviour, their own activity as a politician and just looking at what she does and what she says, there is no doubt that Suella Bravman is out of control, that her behaviour is irresponsible. I think the issue about getting away with it, as you say, well, look, the Prime Minister is accountable no, for I the whole... Not what Absolutely. The Prime Minister is responsible for all of his government. If he cannot sack someone, if he hasn't agreed to this statement going out, that's about his political weakness, not about the Home Secretary and whatever criteria or whatever background she's brought into this argument. It's about the Prime Minister, and we have to find that out today. You know what I'm going to ask you next? Please answer me honestly. Should the Prime Minister sack her? Yes, of course. If Unless he, unless he has signed off on these views, unless they are his views So the views Home Secretary should well. be sacked by the Prime Minister today? Well, unless she's simply representing his view. I mean, if they won't tell us that, it, it may well be the case, though I would imagine if he had signed off on that statement, he would have found it quite easy to tell you and me this morning, so we would know that. But if you have a Home Secretary that is so out of control, so divisive, so inflammatory, undermining the police and therefore the national security and safety of the public, that's not someone who should be Home Secretary. So you should, Saka, um, in your opinion. Um, would you take part in the marches on Saturday? Would I take part? Well, I, I wouldn't because I don't agree with, I think, the, the, the sentiment that drives those, but I don't think... Any march, you know, it's not whether a politician agrees with it. The, the fact is that people will have dissenting views and, and should have the right to protest. We are fundamentally this weekend celebrating freedom, the, the, the freedom we had to fight for as a country, our grandparents had to fight for. And therefore, I think where you can balance the competing activities, competing needs that people have, and the police say they, they can do that, I would back their operational independence. I, I myself would not go on that protest because I would worry about some of the activities and things we've seen and said at some of those in the past, though I accept the majority of people on, on all of those protests are simply expressing a, a very human and, and real desire for an end to human suffering and tragedy. Some of your colleagues would go on those marches. Uh, what advice are they given by the party? Well, our advice is to not go on those marches, and that's not to disrespect the genuine feelings the majority of people will have on a march like that. You will know because you, you've had to report on it. We have seen at some of those marches, you know, things which from a minority of people have... Tiny have, have, minority. Have, but they've glorified, you know, violence. We saw people with paraglider bags on We saw two people it. and they've been charged. We saw statements, yes, but you will understand. I think the public will understand. We would not in any way want to be associated with that. And as unfair as it is, where that minority of people are, I think, undermining the wider message, the wider support that people on that march have. We, we've got to be very sensitive about that. OK, talk to me about energy bills. It is, obviously, we're heading in towards winter again. It was flipping, freezing in my flat last night, let me tell you. You want to bring them down by up to £1,400 by 2030. What about until then? What happens then? Well, look, first of all, the argument we're making today, this is the debate in the House of Commons around the King's speech, is that where we've been so exposed and vulnerable as a country it is to that spike in fossil fuels. 
prices, particularly in such as the gas price to heat your home. It's electricity price as well, because obviously that's set by the price of gas. The real thing this country needs is to never be so vulnerable again. And that's the difference between our position and the Conservative position with the King's speech promoting more oil and gas licensing. We'll never bring down bills in the long term about that. Now, in terms of the short term position, as you say, look, there is a very challenging financial position facing this country. We need to perhaps learn more in two weeks' time in the autumn statement as to how inflation has infected those spending plans and the tax receipts that we have got in. So I can't commit to any specific support today around that. But I think it's very, very important to get across this message to the public that we can chart a path which never again leaves us so vulnerable to the kind of pressures we saw last year and still exist into this year. But we can't do it if we follow the government's plan. I like to think that one of my skills is reading people's body language. And uh, over the last six months or so, you guys are more and more confident when you come in. You think you're going to win the election? We take nothing for granted. I knew you were you know going to say, say I could have written Look, that let's, for let's, you. let's be frank. You know electoral history. No, no government has ever come in Are you all right? with the kind of swing that, 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 you know, if you lose in the style we did in 2019. No one's ever really done that before in one leap. But we are very, very confident that we have been able to change the Labour Party. It's unrecognisable to the party that lost in 2019. We've had to have you know, the humility, not easy for politicians always, to understand why we lost so badly. And because we've done that, Keir Starmer's leadership has been a central part of that. Clearly what we've seen in the by-elections in the last few months is, is that Labour Party is competitive in all parts of the country. So we're not competitive. Can't read anything in by-elections, though. No, well, no, but, you know, there are places that Even we Even I won. know that. There are places that we have won, which I think no-one would really ever expect. Labour to hold in the House of Commons and, and the kind of swings that we've seen. Look, so we're not taking that for granted, but we do take seriously the need to prepare because I think we've seen in, in, in you know, many different people, different politics over the last few years, Boris Johnson, Nicola Sturgeon, people who've won elections, have they delivered on what they wanted to deliver? No, they haven't. So we take seriously the position that we're in, but we take nothing for granted. OK, it's good to see you. Thanks very much for coming in. Thanks a lot. Let's tell you about Donald Trump. He didn't go to a Republican uh, presidential debate again yesterday. His five rivals did. This is what happened. <laughs> in downtown Miami inside a centre for the performing arts, a piece of political theatre without the lead actor. In the absence of Donald Trump far ahead in the polls, the five candidates battling to change the minds of Republican voters. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis was once a Trump acolyte, now he's a critic. And from debate host Lester Holt, the key question. Why should you and not him be the Republican nominee to face Joe Biden a year from now. Donald Trump's a lot different guy than he was in 2016. He owes it to you to be on this stage and explain why he should get another chance. Nikki Haley is bidding to be America's first female president, positioning herself as the leading anti-Trumper. I can tell you that I think he was the right president at the right time. I don't think he's the right president now. This is the first debate since the beginning of the Israel-Gaza war and from all on stage, a hawkish stance. As president of the United States, what would you be urging Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to do at this moment? I would be telling Bibi, finish the job once and for all with these butchers, Hamas. They're terrorists. They're massacring innocent people. They would wipe every Jew off the globe if they could. He cannot live with that threat. It is not that Israel needs America. America needs Israel. They are the tip of the spear when it comes to this Islamic terrorism, and we need to make sure that we have their backs in that process. It's now just two months until the Iowa caucuses, which kick off the Republican nomination process. Inside this spin room, candidates like Ron DeSantis insisting that it's not a foregone conclusion that Donald Trump will be the pick. Five dollar hat. He might not have been there physically, but the former president is never far from these debates. This time he was literally up the road, holding his own rally, also weighing in on foreign policy. Israel, Ukraine would have never happened under the Trump administration. I'm the only candidate who can make this promise to you that I will prevent World War III. You're going to have World War III if we're not careful. The former president's likely to spend much of the next year in courtrooms, but with each indictment, his support deepens. Polling suggests Trump is not only trouncing his Republican rivals, he now has a narrow advantage over this man too. The argument he's unelectable has been dismantled. Martha Kellner, Sky News, Miami.
Uh, government's ordered an inquiry into the deaths of at least 27 people in the English Channel two years ago. Adam has more for us. Hi, Adam, tell us. Hey, yeah, morning, Kay. This is a report from the Maritime uh, Accident Investigation Branch, uh, and it is into this appalling accident disaster in the English Channel a couple of years ago when at least 27, in reality 31 people, died. Uh, when and two people survived when a boat sank in the middle of the channel in the early hours of the morning. Now, the reason that this was particularly difficult was the boat went down pretty much on the median line between the UK and France. It led to an enormous amount of confusion about who was responding. It was a very busy night, and that also led to more confusion about when boats were discovered, were those the ones that the uh, the authorities knew were to be in real peril? In fact, they rescued a series of boats that all had about the same number of people on them. It turned out none of these were the ones from which frantic calls had been received. That was only discovered uh, later on in the daylight. Uh, and as I said, 31 people died. Now, this report points to a series uh, of confusions within the response also says there was a lack of surveillance from the sky. It calls on greater cooperation between the French and British authorities, changes uh, in the surveillance techniques, and also does say that things have improved in the past couple of years. But it's been followed by the government saying it's now going to hold a non statutory inquiry. I think it is worth saying that the French did not cooperate with this report. They've already held their own report and have launched preliminary criminal investigations against five people. Family member I spoke to a little earlier said he thought this British report was a much lesser document, too vague, too ambiguous, and didn't hold anybody responsible. Just one. OK, for now, thank you. Um, quick look at the weather for you. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Sunshine and showers today, turning drier into the weekend, but expect more rain on Sunday. It's quite chilly now, windy with heavy showers in the west, far southwest, far southeast rather, but much of the east is fine, sunny spells. Further showers this morning with thundery downpours likely, but many eastern parts looking like they're going to stay dry. To fly. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Here's an online copy of what the Home Secretary has said today, an article in the Times newspaper. We've heard from Labour, sat here, within the last 10 minutes, Prime Minister needs to sack her today. More on that in just a sec. Well, I mean, this has been an issue um, for some time um, and it always gets worse around winter, which is the, classically the time that every year NHS services are under a lot more pressure. Um, and we're finding patients are opting to go privately for their for their health care um, because it's quicker and, and they feel they'll, they'll get a more prompt service. I think what's happening is um, things like on the day GP services or going to clinics locally that you can pay for. People are choosing to do that because often the wait for their GP can be, be a bit longer. Um, I think the, it does free up appointments probably, but I think what's would be better if we had an inclusive NHS system where everyone could be seen in time. We, you, we, in my practice, we have a triage system, so often the most serious people get seen on the day or quicker if, um, within the hour if we feel that they need to be seen. Um, for the more routine things, that's where people tend to struggle a little bit more. So um, it could be two weeks before they see a routine. Wow. Yeah, and that's a problem, which is why you're often seeing the routine things going to the private sector. Now, it's really important that people actually, if they're in the vulnerable groups get the COVID and the flu vaccines. Often there are extra services put in place because it's such an important thing because reducing the amount of people getting those um, illnesses actually takes pressure off the NHS. So there is a lot of push to getting people done and um, getting these on the weekends or in their local pharmacy, places which are more accessible. <laughs> Thank you.
five of us have made it out of the car. Welcome to Backstage, the film and TV podcast. this everybody sam's here look at this everybody braverman brands met biased over gaza march that is um an article that she's written for the times today the uh, labor party baying for blood they say that she should be sacked by the end of the day yes of course if unless he unless he has signed off on these views unless they are his so the views home secretary as should well. be sacked by the prime minister today well unless She's simply representing his view. I mean, if they won't tell us that, it, it may well be the case, though I would imagine if he had signed off on that statement, he would have found it quite easy to tell you and me this morning, so we would know that. But if you have a Home Secretary that is so out of control, so divisive, so inflammatory, undermining the police and therefore the national security and safety of the public, that's not someone who should be Home Secretary. Sam's here. Willie Sacker? Look, I think there's a real possibility that there could be some movement on this today. It, it, we, we, we've talked quite a lot about issues that the Prime Minister's had with Suella Braverman, but this feels on a, on, a, on, a, on a different level, quite frankly, because we have a Home Secretary that looks as if she is going further than I've seen before a Home Secretary in interfering with the operational independence of the police. That's a, uh, that's a sort of enshrined in um, convention and code. Um, you have a Home Secretary who is doubling down on the tax of the police just as the Prime Minister is going in the other direction. And then you have some infla inflammatory language around Northern Ireland and, and it, it effectively implying that um, uh, what goes on in Northern Ireland themselves are hate marches. Um, but, but this isn't really a story about the Home Secretary and the police. Really, it's a story about power and the power dynamic between Rishi Sunak and his Home Secretary. Because at the moment, it, 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 there's an impression she's calling the shots. She says an inflammatory thing and then number 10 have to decide how to react. We had it all weekend with whether or not living on the streets and a tent is a lifestyle choice. We've got it now with the Home Secretary putting down a marker. Now, is she trying to get sacked? Some people think that. I think there's a very real debate about whether or not Rishi Sunak can afford to have her on the back benches. I think there's a very real debate amongst allies of Suella Braverman whether she wants to be in the government. On the one hand, you know, you uh, may just end up, and some of them talk about being like Priti Patel, not not particularly influential figure uh, on the back benches. Uh, but could she, if she wants to be? Uh, Tory leader after the election, uh, in the event of a Tory defeat, end up being tainted by playing part of a government that she fundamentally doesn't really agree uh, a great deal with. So those are the kind of dynamics, the conversations. There are people calling, people in government calling for Rishi Sunak to sack her. I'm not sure that they weren't already they're exactly the same people who were already calling for her to be sacked this morning, before this morning. Let's bring in David, should we? You mentioned Northern Ireland. Uh, he's live in Belfast. What do the good people of Northern Ireland think about uh, this piece in The Times today? Well, unionists and loyalists are not yet calling for her to be sacked, but they are calling her on her to urgently clarify her comments. We have to, I think, guess at this stage that Suella Braverman was meaning to compare those who are marching in support of Palestine with Irish Republicans or dissident Irish Republicans who still pose a terrorist threat in Northern Ireland. But the wording was so clumsy because the vast majority of marches that take place here are organised organised by Protestant loyal orders who say they are marching in defence of the Protestant faith. So they don't take kindly to being uh, compared to those who are marching in defence of Islam. And I think it's also worth pointing out that the Home Secretary appears to have forgotten that it was a political party very closely aligned with loyal marching orders, the Democratic Unionists, who shored up the minority Tory government with a £1 billion confidence and supply deal back in 2017. So it's either very clumsy or very ignorant and worth also adding that it's very dangerous given the current political vacuum in Northern Ireland with no power sharing government in place. Um. So the key bit from my perspective, what David just said was his talk about clumsy language because that goes actually to a slightly different live debate that's going on. Did number 10 look at it? Did number 10 sign it off? Did number 10 sign off exactly that clumsy language. Now, number 10 aren't saying, um, 
allies, wider allies of Suella Braverman are claiming that the Downing Street operation knew that this was coming and saw it before publication. We'll wait until both sides confirm that before we call that a fact. But for that kind of language that David was talking about to get through the system, uh, I think is, is, is pretty extraordinary. And Eva speaks to a carelessness of the Home Office or perhaps even a carelessness of the uh, organisation as a whole. But really, this is a, 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 a battle of wills. Rishi Sunak has to, dis has to decide whether or not he wants Suella Braverman looking like he's, uh, she's calling the shots or whether he wants Suella Braverman on the back benches, potentially a martyr or potentially not really much of anything, another former Home Secretary who grumbles uh, from the green benches behind him. That, that really is the choice today. Mm. It, does it feel like a pivotal moment where you are this morning, David? Well, I think it's certainly a very difficult moment for the Prime Minister, given that he's already struggling to see the power-sharing government in Northern Ireland restored. The DUP are currently boycotting that in a protest at post-Brexit trading arrangements, that trading border in the Irish Sea. The relationship between the DUP, the largest unionist party here, and the government has been cool for months now. This will do nothing to thaw that ice. And while we have that kind of political stalemate and that political vacuum here, there is a very real danger because it is still a fragile piece in Northern Ireland. Always worth reminding people that this is the only part of the United Kingdom where the terrorist threat is still deemed severe. And that's why language like Hamas and terrorism being spoken in the same breath as Northern Ireland in marches will be deemed by many not just as inflammatory, but showing blatant disregard for the sensitivities of the peace process. Labour wants to have gone by tea time, Sam. Yeah, I think they can see that this row is of a different order to the ones like that we had at the weekend. But the people to watch, Labour often call for Tories to, to go eventually. They're quite cautious with their language, they, though, generally. They, 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 I was surprised. It, I, I was just flying a kite and he went for it. He, he, he did. They don't do it all the time, but it's not unheard of that the opposition calls for a, uh, a, a minister to go. But do you know where I'd look, Kay? I, I'd look back at the police. What do you think Mark Rowley is thinking this morning as he reads... Sorry, got his head in his hands. ..as he reads that the person who ultimately has the ministerial charge of the brief uh, for the police is calling the police effectively biased, is calling his force, is calling him uh, biased. How could he remain in his job? What conversations is he having with Downing Street this morning? And could that actually make a big difference? So, th just to remind people, if they're just tuning our way, this is the article. Um, it's, not, it's unfortunate the Prime Minister's wife is uh, just above it, I'm sure. Please must be even-handed with protests, is what Suella Braverman is saying, page 7 of the Times today. It's a comment piece. She says that the Met is playing favourites, uh, claiming that senior officers are biased, employing double standards towards pro-Palestinian marches compared to right-wing protests. Um, she also compared what she called hate marches to sectarian parades in Northern Ireland. We've heard from David uh, what uh, the view is on that one. Um, and she goes on to say, unfortunately, there's a perception that senior police officers play favourites when it comes to protesters. That's right. In the last few seconds, really, just in communication with senior Tories there, they're, they're, I can tell you they're now looking very carefully at the more general reaction, reaction of Tories and, and absolutely the reaction of the police. And I think... I think there's a sense amongst some... Well, that it, the Irish Sea. Uh, of course. But I think particularly uh, the Conservative Party. If, I'm told, if this kicks off politically amongst Tories in particular, uh, that uh, some people think that uh, she's going to have to go. Well, goodness. Uh, David, still with us. David, final thought from you. Um, political leaders uh, in uh, Northern Ireland likely to react? Yes, well, I think, as I said earlier, Kay, this isn't just an own goal. It's a hat-trick of own goals. It's not just displaying ignorance and offence, but it's also highly dangerous. If she was meaning to refer, for example, to the Catholic civil rights marches of the late 60s and 70s instead of Protestant loyal order marches, she's clearly forgotten Bloody Sunday when 14 innocent civilians were shot dead during a civil rights march in Derry. That's why this will be deemed very offensive and very difficult for people across Northern Ireland this morning. Final thoughts, sir. Looking at her, looking at the scale of the reaction, does it mean that she can stay in the job? But there are also are Conservatives, not in the Home Office, looking as well at Mark Rowley and looking at what actually happens on Saturday. Because there is a real nervousness that the commander of the Met Police has got this wrong. 
Uh, and I, I think there's a complicated power dynamic. If something happens today, but then the march goes wrong on Saturday, where does that leave everybody? Uh, but if Mark Rowley made the right call and he's ended up in, at loggerheads with the Home Secretary, uh, then that takes us to a very different place. It's not clear uh, what happens after that. I think it's a horrible mess in Downing Street. OK, Sam, for now, thank you. Labour calling for the Home Secretary to be sacked by tea time unless the Prime Minister signed off on her inflammatory uh, article, which is in The Times today. Continuing coverage on Sky. I'm Martha Kellner and I'm Sky's US correspondent based here in Los Angeles. It's turning everybody into, you know, a crazy, violent drug addict. How are you feeling? I am angry. It is an anti-woman agenda. Two women say that you paid for their abortions. Are you a hypocrite, sir? Will your candidates win? I hope so. I think they will. I think they're great candidates. I gotta be realistic. My sister's dead. More than four weeks on, there's no murder weapon and no suspect. Are you going to catch this killer? We are doing everything we can. Glenn Maxwell has pleaded not guilty to all six charges against her. Mum, how are you feeling today? Jeffrey said, you answer to Gillian. You just don't cross her. I'm so excited. Severe nightmares of these people coming in and just taking me in the middle of the night. I've watched as whole towns were torn apart by natural disaster. I'm alive and I'm thankful for that, but there are a lot of people who aren't. It's not the winds people fear most here, it's the water. We take you to the heart of the stories which shape our world. Do you truly believe what you're saying? A lot of cases that I know are reported from Ukrainian missiles themselves. A ambassador, with respect, I think that's preposterous. Let's talk about Armistice Day. Should we? Rishi Sharma, founder of Remember World War II, is with us. You'll recognise the guy in the middle, Dan Snow, historian, of course, uh, director of History Hit, and Colin Bell. Hi. Hi. You're 102? And a bit. Don't forget And a bit. bit. I won't. Yeah. Old veteran, it says yeah. here. It's a bit harsh. Huh? An old veteran, it says here. Absailing veteran. Well, I'm the I'm known in the RAF club as the ancient absailer. <laughs> Tell me why. Well, because I abseiled quite recently down the London Hospital all 17 storeys. Amazing. Well, I thought it was a bit amazing too. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly when I looked down. <laughs> Tell me where you served. Huh? Tell me where you served. Where I served. served. Where... I served in Downham Market in Norfolk, which was one of the uh, Pathfinder Group uh, airfields. And that was in um, uh, that was in September '44, uh, and I was flying the mosquito bombers. And where were you flying? Tell her where you were flying. Well, I used to fly it almost exclusively over Germany, 
I did 50 missions uh, for my tour and I did 13 of them over Berlin. And Berlin was a rather hairy place to fly over. Yeah. Tell me how it felt when you were doing that. Um, hairy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Tell me about some of your experiences. Uh, my experience? Some of your experiences while you were flying. Well, um, the, probably one of the worst experiences was when uh, I was uh, on my fifth trip, I think, and um, due to my inexperience, uh, a shell came up underneath and it lifted the whole of the aircraft up and um, uh, it cut off the fuel supply Whoa. and both the propellers were sort of rotating around but without any power. And my navigator, who was a Canadian, a uh, big ex, ex lumberjack, he's a big chap. He said, What do we do now? Which I thought was rather <laughs> a silly question. And I said, Well, we wait, don't we? And we waited, and uh, eventually the power came on again. And um, uh, I, uh, I angled the aircraft away from Berlin. And uh, I looked across at him, Kay, and I said, uh, You weren't frightened, were you? And he said, No, I wasn't frightened. I was bloody terrified. <laughs> Dan, tell me how you've got involved with these two fabulous yeah. gentlemen. Well, I've known Colin for years. He's just one of, an example of this extraordinary generation um, uh, who we need to interview and record these wonderful stories. And I came across Rishi the other day because he is a man on a mission. He, is, he goes round the world sleeping in his car on this, with this obsession interviewing people like Colin, World War II veterans. How many have you done now? Just over 2,200 <coughs> World War II veterans across the US, Canada, the UK, Australia, New Zealand. We focus on all the allied countries. As uh, Dan Snow mentioned, I'm on a mission to meet and interview as many heroes, people like Colin Bell, World War II combat veterans, and we want to get them all on camera, which is why I'm here in the UK. And, and I'm passionate, so I've, I've, done a, I've done a tiny bit of that in the UK, nothing compared to Rishi, and so we're trying to join forces and see how many more we can get. And we've got Colin in a bag now, you'll be glad to know. Yeah. What are you going to do with the information? So we share these interviews with the world. Uh, we have a YouTube channel, Remember World War II. We give copies, of course, of the film. They're all video interviews. The veterans get complimentary copies. We share it with schools and universities. The purpose of this archive that we have and that we're building is to make sure future generations innately understand the true sacrifices made by the men and women in World War II for our way of life and the modern luxuries that are afforded to us. The, pri the, re the reality is they didn't come out of thin air. They were paid for with blood shed and sacrifice. And if we don't take the time to step back and really acknowledge what people like Mr. Bell went through for our freedoms, we're gonna forget about it. Do you think the younger generation appreciate what people like you? Would well, I don't through? think, I'm no longer the younger generation, but I don't think I appreciate, I don't think I can appreciate fully when you hear stories like that. I mean, you can read them, you can ask, but it is, it is just extraordinary when, when, you, when you spend time like Rishi's done with, the, with these veterans and hear their stories, civilians on the home front, people in factories as well, uh, but also people on, on the front line. But I, I do think as we get further away, we've got an even bigger job to do. I had my grandpa, I used to talk to him endlessly about it. Young people today, it's a distance. It's like, it's like us with the Battle of Waterloo. You know, it's a long way back to the First World War, even to the Second World War. So I think that it, it's, it's just... We, that, that, but we can use modern technology, and that's what Rishi's doing. It's, it's interviewing these people and then making them very available online, and it's great. And people like Colin, they tell a good story, and you can engage young people. <laughs> well, I was there, you see, wasn't yeah. I? Yeah. I was there. I don't go back as far as the Battle of Waterloo. Oh, I know, I thought that was a but, bit harsh. But I do go back quite a long way. Colin, how do you feel about taking your memory back to that time? Oh, well, I'm rather pleased to be able to do so. Uh, I think it's for the benefit of the younger generation that they should know what, in fact, uh, we were fighting for and uh, the fact that we were fighting uh, for their freedoms and... Uh, uh, also, I might add, for our own survival, because the Germans have got some very nasty plans afoot if they ever subjugated us. So, uh, yes, it was something we had to do. And uh, I don't like the word heroes being applied to me because um, I flew the probably the very best aircraft everyone could hope to fly for if you were in the air in World War II. The real heroes... 
um, were the, and I say again, I don't consider myself a hero, the real heroes were the chaps that flew the slower, heavy bombers because they were so much more vulnerable and they suffered casualties far in excess of the people like myself who were flying mosquitoes. So, but it was a job that had to be done and um, well, you just got on with it. Humility. Humili yeah. Unbelievable humility. And actually, it's a good point, Nat, because Rishi's here for a month. He would love to interview as many of those... Lan I think you're talking about the Lancaster bombers in particular. We've got lots of Lancaster bombers you want to interview. So if anybody is part of a veterans group or a care or association, tr get in touch with Rishi. He's here. He's going to be racing around the country and we'd love Lancaster bombers, you know, crew, air crew. It, 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 of course, anyone who's flown Spitfires, hurricanes, things like that. So anybody, it would be great to get in touch. And, and Rishi yeah. will be on the case. Yeah. The bat Some Rishi. sent up. Yeah, he's a remarkable young man. I, I've, ne I've never met anybody like him or equal to him. Yeah. He was going to say something, Colin, and you interrupted him. What? He was going to, just going to say something and you interrupted him. <laughs> well, all I was going to say is that heroes don't call themselves heroes. Exactly. That. And, and the reality is uh, most of the veterans who I meet do not acknowledge uh, that they are heroes and they say it's really the men who were killed laying in the graves overseas. But we should all acknowledge that he could have just as easily ended up there. And he put his life on the line so that people like me, like Dan Snow, like you, can be here. And that's why I do what I do. I truly believe at the end of the day that my existence is because of people like Mr. Bell. The World War II generation literally saved the world wow. and we owe it to them to make sure that their sacrifices were not made in vain. And you talked earlier, ma'am, about the younger generations. I'm 25 years old and I have to admit, most of my peers don't know anything about World War II, nor do they really care. But the beauty of the Dan Snow's platform of History Hit, the YouTube channel, Remember World War II, is we're reaching the younger audience. And I was just like them until I started to meet the veterans. Meeting someone who is willing to die for you gives you a whole new perspective on your life. It makes you realize how fortunate you are in everyday circumstances. I'm from Los Angeles. You can't complain about traffic in LA after you're coming home of, from an interview with a veteran who lost his arm at the Battle of the Bulge. And, uh, I, I am also cognizant, even though I'm an American, the UK, you guys were in the war two years before us. You in the Commonwealth, it is so important that an American audience understands what the British people went through. And I want to be able to interview as many World War II veterans here in the UK. And I would encourage people, if they know any World War II veterans, co please go to rememberworldwar2.org. And he, he's too polite to say so, but he is sleeping in his car. So if anyone wants to look up GoFundMe, you can give him a fiver and maybe you have a hotel for the night as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's a good point in the sense that Remember World War II is a nonprofit organization. Yeah. All the money that's donated goes directly into the travel and production of getting these heroes on camera. Uh, I don't take a salary. For seven years, I've not taken a salary. I started this when I was in high school. And it's not about me, but the only way I've been able to afford the travel and to do so many interviews is to cut costs. As he mentioned, I sleep in the car, I'll skip meals, but it doesn't matter because when you get to sit in front of someone and look them in their eyes, someone who is willing to go overseas to fight the good fight, it makes it all worth it. And to yeah. know that their great, great, great grandkids yeah. will always get to know them. Yeah. Well, Tell me about Armistice Day and how important it is to you. Well, it's terribly important because it's a time of reflection of all those people that lost their lives fighting for our freedom. And it's something that, um, uh, well, it, it creates emotions. I mean, uh, all World War I people, as well as World War II, um, it's a time for reflection and respect, isn't it? Um, and not only, I might add, and we must remember too, that it's not only uh, British people, but uh, our American friends who came over and fought, and of course, our Commonwealth uh, people, the, uh, the Canadians, the New Zealanders, the Australians, South Africans, they came from afar and they all fought for our freedom, our joint freedom, and uh, uh, yes, it makes one thoughtful. Abseiling, what's next? Ah, you realise that the abseiling was done to raise money for charity. Uh, three charities, the London Air Ambulance Brigade, uh, the, or the uh, Royal Air Force Benevolent Fund, 
and the uh, uh, the nursing uh, I, I forget the nurses uh, anyway yeah. the nurses uh, so I was merely a vehicle to attract attention so that people should contribute to this and abseiling was a good way of doing it too um, yeah he brought in I think at the last count I think something in the order of fifty-six thousand pounds. Not a lot of money, amazing. but they would have been that much short of it if, I, if what's it the, hadn't been. What's raised. the next challenge? What's the next challenge? The next challenge. Well, I have in mind doing a, um, a solo parachute, <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, uh, I'm not going to do one of these things where you're strapped to. Uh, experienced parachutists. That's I cheating. think a lady in Chicago has oh, done that. Oh, can I implore you to do and that, all, please? <laughs> all the credit to her at the age of 84. Yeah. But if I do it, I'm going to do it solo. OK. Colin, Dan, Rishi, we are out of time. Thank you so much for taking the time well, to join us. Thank that's you. That's all right. Lovely Appreciate to meet you. Appreciate it. That's a strong handshake right there. Yeah. We'll see you in just a second yeah. here on Sky. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Nine o'clock. Very welcome to join us for the final hour of the breakfast show here on the Sky News. Here's a question for you this morning. Will the Home Secretary still have her job by tea time? Labour calling on the Prime Minister to sack her, Suella Braverman. They say she should be dismissed after accusing the police of playing favourites with protesters. Unless, of course, he signed off on those comments. Thursday, 9th of November. 
A government source brands the Home Secretary ignorant after she says hate marches are what we are more used to seeing in Northern Ireland. A strong response from Labour and a former Chief Superintendent. Please answer me honestly, should the Prime Minister sack her? Yes, of course. If, unless, he, unless he has signed off on these views. And so some of the things that Suella Bradman is saying as a, as a, a, a brown woman um, would, would not be tolerated if it was said by a white man, a white woman. Poll for Sky News finds half of Britain thinks Saturday's Armistice Day march by pro-Palestinian protesters should be banned. Here in Jerusalem, there are reports of a possible three-day ceasefire in exchange for the release of hostages. Also ahead, the government orders an independent inquiry into the deaths of 27 people in the English Channel in 2021. Making tech safer, Ofcom unveils new rules to protect children online. The end of panda diplomacy. Three of the giant bears on loan from China to the US are shipped home. And... Ran! Ran! Can I have this? It's the John Lewis ad. It must be nearly Christmas. Quickie bum time for the Home Secretary this morning. Labour calling on the Prime Minister to sack her after she accused the Metropolitan Police of playing favourites with protesters. Suella Braverman claimed that senior officers, let me tell you more, are biased and employed a double standard towards pro-Palestinian marches compared to right-wing protesters. Writing in The Times, Suella Braverman said, I don't believe that these marches are merely a cry for help for Gaza. They are an assertion of primacy by certain groups, particularly Islamists, of the kind we are more used to seeing in Northern Ireland. Also disturbingly reminiscent of Ulster are the reports that some of Saturday's March group organisers have links to terrorist groups, including Hamas. She went on, unfortunately, there is a perception that senior police officers play favourites when it comes to protesters. Right-wing and nationalist protesters who engage in aggression are rightly met with a stern response, yet pro-Palestinian mobs displaying almost identical behaviour are largely ignored, even when clearly breaking the law. Well, earlier I asked Labour's Jonathan Reynolds if he thinks Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister, should sack his Home Secretary. The Prime Minister is responsible for all of his government. If he cannot sack someone, if he hasn't agreed to this statement going out, that's about his political weakness, not about the Home Secretary and whatever criteria or whatever background she's brought into this argument. It's about the Prime Minister and we have to find that out today. You know what I'm going to ask you next. Please answer me honestly. Should the Prime Minister sack her? Yes, of course. If unless he unless he has signed off on these views, unless they are his so the views. So the Home Secretary as should well. be sacked by the Prime Minister today. Well, unless She's simply representing his view. I mean, if they won't tell us that, it, it may well be the case, though I would imagine if he had signed off on that statement, he would have found it quite easy to tell you and me this morning, so we would know that. But if you have a Home Secretary that is so out of control, so divisive, so inflammatory, undermining the police and therefore the national security and safety of the public, that's not someone who should be Home Secretary. Right, so this is a big deal. Sam's here, David standing by for us in Belfast. They're up in arms over uh, the Irish Sea as well. But first to you, Sam, our deputy political editor, of course, to give you your Sunday title. What's going to happen? We don't know. I think that there is a real chance that the Prime Minister has to be considering sacking her. I don't know that for certain, but there are certainly people uh, calling for, for her to go, including people uh, that are in Rishi Sunak's government uh, today. Look, we have the spectacle of a Home Secretary who appears, in sort of broad brush terms, to be questioning the operational independence of the police, appears to be questioning the judgment of the Metropolitan Police, in particular uh, the uh, Chief Constable Mark Rowley. Um, and that is a, just a very awkward position for any government to be in. The police and the government meant to be uh, independent of one another. The next problem is that you've got a Home Secretary who is basically saying the Met are making the wrong decision about this march on Saturday, letting it go ahead, at a point where the Prime Minister 
yesterday, at the end of a long, intense day, appeared to say, OK, I understand why uh, the uh, Met Police Commissioner uh, is... Uh, is allowing this march to go ahead. We'll, we'll see what happens. So she's in a different position to him. And then the third problem that you've got is a Home Secretary using language that is inflammatory about Northern Ireland, one of the most delicate parts of the United Kingdom. So you put all that in, a, in, in the mix, in a wider context, that we have a Home Secretary who just dominates the conversation the whole time. It looks a little bit like Rishi Sunak is endlessly dancing to her tune. Does he agree or disagree with the latest thing that she said at the weekend? It was about whether or not um, being homeless was a lifestyle choice. Uh, today, uh, it, it is these, it, these comments. Who's in charge? Is Rishi Sunak now strong enough to sack her uh, or thinks it's important to leave her in place, perhaps because she's got quite a lot of allies on the back benches? Um, I, I think it's a very del delicate and difficult moment for her. David, why are the good people of Northern Ireland so offended by what the Home Secretary has said in that article this morning? Where do we start, Kay? Suella Breverman doesn't appear to understand that the vast majority of marches in Northern Ireland are organised by Protestant loyal orders, those who regard themselves as the most loyal subjects of the Crown. They're not organised by dissident Irish Republicans generally, who continue to pose a severe terrorist threat. She also doesn't appear to understand how offensive it is to liken Protestants who are marching, they would say in defence of their Christian faith with those who are marching in defence of Islam. And if she actually was meaning to refer to the Catholic civil rights movement of the late 60s and 70s, she's also forgotten that 14 innocent civilians were shot dead by the British Army on Bloody Sunday during a civil rights march in Northern Ireland. But I think what will worry most people is how inflammatory this language is at a time when there is a political vacuum in Northern Ireland. The DUP continues to boycott power sharing over post-Brexit trading arrangements. And when you have that kind of political vacuum, it doesn't do anything to secure the fragile peace we have here. And many people will see this as a blatant disregard for those kind of sensitivities in Northern Ireland. That's right. I mean, look, all of this is about power play. The, it, at the end of the day, Rishi Sunak's got to decide whether or not he'll look too weak to keep her and he can, or he can risk making her a martyr by sacking her. But there are other calculations, I understand, at the top of government this morning. Imagine a world, and this is all about the protest on Saturday, OK? Imagine a world in which the protest goes ahead, which we expect it to, but, but things go wrong on that march. It gets ugly. And then it looks as if Mark Rowley's judgment today was wrong and Suella Braverman's judgment was right. Where does that leave the Prime Minister if he takes action today? That's one complication that they are having to think through uh, at the top of Downing Street. This isn't, this is a multi-dimensional problem. There's the Northern Ireland bit, there's the policing bit, uh, there's the internal Tory power struggle bit. That, that, it's 3D chess for Rishi Sunak. It's not quite clear where we're going to end up today. But it's a problem of the Home Secretary's making for him and that is, you know, when, when you peel away all those layers of the onion, that's the issue. And, and it's it, not, not for the first time. Not for the first time. Gentlemen, I know you're going to join me again later on. For now, thanks very much indeed. So a senior government source telling Sky News that Ms Braverman's comments are wholly offensive and ignorant of where people in Northern Ireland stand on the issues of Israel and Gaza. We also spoke to a former uh, police officer from the Met earlier, and this is what he had to say. And so some of the things that Suala Braverman is saying has a as a, a, a brown woman um, would would not be tolerated if it was said by a white man, a white woman. You know, some of the things she said about uh, Pakistani men, some of the things she's saying about hate marches. You know, I, I'm, I'm just flabbergasted by some of the conversations and some of the comments that she's making. I hope we take the heat out of this. I hope we listen to what Sir Mark Rowley says, who is a, a police officer with extraordinary levels of uh, experience. And, and we let the police get, to get on with what they're doing, which is um, policing and making London safe. Uh, we shouldn't be making the job of the police more difficult. Uh, what do the British public think? Well, yeah, we've asked them, Kay, 2,000 people, uh, YouGov doing a survey for Sky News. And, you know, all this, everything you've been talking about, all this controversy today, when it comes down to that basic question where all this started is, do you think this march should be allowed to go ahead on Armistice Day, on uh, Saturday? Uh, we asked the public, 
half of all Britons think that march should be banned. 34% of people think it should go ahead. But, you know, that is a huge amount of support when it's put that starkly in terms of whether that march should happen. So, actually, the public tending to agree with Suella Braverman's basic position, if not the sort of rhetoric we've heard about today, because that's very new and we haven't asked them about that. Um, and that's really sort of where we've seen the most sort of clear agreement on one issue. The rest of this in the Israel-Hamas war, the British public very divided. It might have felt very divisive over the last sort of four weeks. And that is reflected in the polling. If you ask people which side do you agree with more in this conflict, Israel and Palestine have been fairly equal. Palestine, the Palestinian side there and green at the bottom has just edged ahead. But they've both been around 20% for uh, most of it. It's very, very entrenched. What has changed is people have gone going from not knowing about the conflict before the attacks uh, on October the 7th to sympathising with both sides equally. That is the majority British position. But the other people, uh, bit where you know people maybe dif- disagree with where government is in terms of the government position on what Israel should be doing militarily in Gaza. The government position being uh, that they should be a temporary ceasefire, and that's Labour's position. But actually, the UK public, 31% of people, the most uh, popular option here, they oppose Israel's actions. They push for them to call a ceasefire. And with all this data, there's a lot of drilling down you can do. You know, support for the Israeli side tends to be among conservative voters, older voters. Uh, For the Palestinian side, it's younger voters. Of support for a ceasefire. Labour voters, a long way away from uh, where Keir Starmer is, a lot more of them support a, a proper ceasefire rather than a humanitarian pause uh, than is being endorsed by their leader at the moment. So that could lead to more tension. But yeah, it does just show this is such a divisive topic. Sure is. Thanks very much indeed, Tom. How likely is uh, a ceasefire? Cordelia standing by in Jerusalem for us. What is the latest, Cordelia? Good morning. Good morning, Kay. There are reports of discussions between uh, of a possible three-day ceasefire, which would enable critical humanitarian aid to get through to Gaza. The death toll, according to the Gaza Health Ministry, has reached 10,500. Now, the suggestion is that there's possibly talks around a dozen hostages, including uh, foreign passport holders, being released in exchange uh, for a pause uh, in Israeli airstrikes there in Gaza. Now, this is all about trust building, and there's not a lot of trust on either side right now. But we know, Kay, that the Qataris have been central in negotiations, trying to uh, broker possible uh, cessation uh, in fighting. We will have to see where this goes uh, in the coming days. Okay, for now. Thank you, Mark. Actually, in southern Israel as well for us this morning. Uh, Rafa border, I believe, still closed today. Some sort of incident. What do we know, Mark? No, no incident, Kay. Uh, The border is open, uh, and and actually it's a very interesting insight. We are uh, on the the border between Israel and Egypt, Nizana it's called, uh, and it is one of the border crossings through which aid is uh, supposed to be uh, coming through. You can see here some of the trucks. These are Egyptian trucks. You can see the Egyptian plates uh, on them here. Uh, All of these trucks are filled with humanitarian aid. Uh, On this one, uh, I can see baby products uh, from Indonesia. Uh, the Egyptian Red Crescent here uh, on some of these uh, pallets. This is donations that have been made, uh, and the idea is that they can get to the people of Gaza. The challenge uh, is is access. Now, um, although there has been talk about uh, no humanitarian aid getting in, that's not actually strictly true. There is some aid getting in, uh, but it is massively insufficient. About 100 trucks a day at the moment are being uh, allowed to pass from Egypt into Israel to this border point where they are security screened. The Israelis do not trust uh, what is on these trucks. And so all of them are security screened uh, at, at times, several times. They then pass back into Egypt and drive up the the border, a straight line, uh, up to the Rafah crossing in Egypt. The Israelis uh, say they have eyes on them the whole time, so I imagine that's from drones which are looking at these trucks, which have then been screened. They pass up the border and then go in to Egypt, to uh, Gaza, through the Rafah crossing. Uh, Now, for context, we're talking about 100 trucks a day at the moment. That is not very much. Under normal times, before the war, about 400 
500 trucks were, were, were passing uh, from Egypt uh, into Gaza with food uh, and all the rest of it that, 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 uh, that, that the people of Gaza need. So 100 trucks is massively insufficient. The UN, uh, who I've spoken to this morning, say what they want is a 24-hour process uh, to get aid into Gaza. And at the moment, uh, that really is not happening. 100 trucks a day uh, with just uh, a few bits and pieces. And as we spin around here, you can see some of the... Um, uh, the pallets being offloaded here uh, 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 so that they can be security screened. They will be loaded back on again uh, once the screening has happened. Uh, and then they can, uh, as I say, proceed along that border uh, on the Egyptian side and then in through Rafa. Remember too, Kay, that the Rafa crossing it is primarily a pedestrian crossing. It's not usually used for heavy uh, goods to come through. The other two crossings, the one in the north, uh, that is the Erez crossing, and Karem Shalom, which is on the, uh, the Israeli side down here, they are both closed. Rafa is closed because Hamas destroyed it uh, on the, uh, on the, um, uh, in the October attacks. Uh, and Karem Shalom is closed because the Israelis will not open it. So the only aid that is getting in at the moment is coming through here, uh, and it is not nearly as, as much as the, uh, as the people of Gaza would want. Uh, the one last thing I should add is that, interestingly, the Israeli commander here uh, who runs this crossing, it's a military-run crossing, uh, said that in his view there is no humanitarian crisis uh, in Gaza. Uh, he said it's a humanitarian challenge, but to call it a crisis, uh, he said, is not correct. I mean, clearly... Uh, my view would be that the images inside, certainly inside northern Gaza, okay. where people have been, uh, have been heavily bombed, uh, it's rather different. And I just want to make doubly clear from what you're saying, Mark, because we're hearing um, in the UK that there was, a, there was a security issue and the border had been closed for some hours. From where you are now, you're the man on the ground. If there was, that has now passed and the aid can flow freely again. Well, no, it's, it's, not that, it's more nuanced than that. There isn't a security... Well, there's a security issue in that they want to check everything. There is no incident that has taken place. The border is open. Uh, trucks have been passing through, but as I say, it is a trickle. It is not in the numbers uh, that aid agencies who are discussing it today in Paris, um, it's not in the numbers uh, that they say are desperately needed. Thanks for the clarification, Mark. Um, much appreciated. Thank you. Back home, I want to tell you about a 14-year-old boy. He's been charged with murder after a 15-year-old who was stabbed near a school in Leeds. Alfie Lewis died following the stabbing in Horsforth on Tuesday. The arrested team will appear at Leeds Magistrates Court today. He's also charged with possession of a knife. The RMT says it's reached a deal with train operators that could bring their long-running dispute to an end. Earlier, the Transport Secretary told me he hopes... Members of the rail union will accept the pay deal. Meanwhile, the union leader insisted his union had held strong in negotiations with the government. I wanted the RMT to put the deal to their members, to give their members the chance to express a view on it. I'm very pleased that the train operating companies and the RMT were able to issue a joint statement yesterday saying they'd reached agreement and that the RMT is going to ask their members to express a view. When they did on Network Rail, their yeah. members voted overwhelmingly to accept it. That's what I hope they do, so that they can get a pay rise, uh, we can get on with then focusing on getting more people back sure. on the railways to deal with its financial sustainability post-pandemic. Sounds as though, from what you're saying, the, the uh, union's folded, but let's see what our RMT uh, leader says when he comes on. The government has backed down on its agenda. They said we would only get a pay rise if we accepted all of these cuts and all these attacks. We've defended our railways pension scheme. There'll be no changes to that, which they were seeking to cut billions out of. So we haven't given way on anything. We've got a straightforward pay deal with a job security agreement, which we're putting to our members, and then we'll go into a process to discuss the changes the companies are seeking. In other news, Ofcom has published its first guidelines to tackle illegal content online. The regulator has told social media platforms to exclude children from suggested friends lists, preventing children from becoming friends with or messaging unrelated people. US Actors Union has agreed to what it says is a tentative deal with Hollywood Studios bosses to end its 118-day strike. The dispute has delayed films including Disney's Lilo and Stitch and the latest Paddington movie. And blood tests to help detect early Alzheimer's could be available on the NHS in the next five years. The UK's leading dementia charities are funding a £5 million study to help bring tests into clinical use. Scientists say it would be cheaper than current methods and enable patients to get diagnosed sooner. 
Still to come, Israel continues to push on in Gaza. We speak to a former defence attaché plus. Stopping stranger danger online and the new rules to tackle illegal content. And... John Lewis Ann, must be nearly Christmas. Morning, everybody. It is 8 o'clock. You're very welcome to join us on the Sky News wherever you're watching us. Chancellor will be joining us in just a few moments' time. Evidence of the cost of living crisis. And we'll start with breaking news. There's only one place to start this morning. It's the dollar. Ever. It's like might fell. It's five o'clock. This is the news hour. I'm Mark Austin coming up in the next 60 minutes. Welcome to the politics hub on the UK tonight throughout the course of the week. Uh, still to come. Well, I mean, this has been an issue um, for some time um, and it always gets worse around winter, which is classically the time that every year NHS services are under a lot more pressure. Um, and we're finding patients are opting to go privately for their for their health care um, because it's quicker and, and they feel they'll, they'll get a more prompt service. I think what's happening is um, things like on the day GP services or going to clinics locally that you can pay for. People are choosing to do that because often the wait for their GP can be, be a bit longer. Um, I think that it does free up appointments, probably, but I think what would be better if we had an inclusive NHS system where everyone could be seen in time. We, you, we, in my practice, we have a triage system, so often the most serious people get seen on the day or quicker if, um, within the hour if we feel that they need to be seen. Um, for the more routine things, that's where people tend to struggle a little bit more, so um, it could be two weeks before they see a routine. Wow. Yeah, and that's a problem, which is why you're often seeing the routine things going to the private sector. Now, it's really important that people actually, if they're in the vulnerable groups get the COVID and the flu vaccines. Often there are extra services put in place because it's such an important thing because reducing the amount of people getting those um, illnesses actually takes pressure off the NHS. So there is a lot of push to get people done and um, getting these on the weekends or in their local pharmacy, places which are more accessible. <laughs> Again, everybody, you're watching The Breakfast Show here on Sky News. And uh, it's Thursday morning, of course, isn't it? Oh, my goodness, is there a row brewing over our Home Secretary? Um, Labour calling for her to be sacked by the end of the day. Why? We'll tell you in just a moment. Before that, though, I want to tell you about uh, an inquiry that the government has uh, ordered into the deaths of at least 27 people in the English Channel. That happened two years ago. Uh, Adam has more. Hi, Adam, tell me more. Yeah, morning, Kay. Uh, this was a, a horrendous incident in the Channel back in November 2021. 33 people got onto what was palpably an unsuitable boat crossing the Channel, as over a 1,000 people did over the course of those 24 hours. 
The difference was that this boat sank in the channel. Now, this report is into the response of the British authorities into that. Did they respond quickly enough? Uh, did they do the right things? It runs through over 100 pages, and its conclusions are that there were mistakes, that at one point the response was overwhelmed by the number of calls that were coming in. It was confused by the number of boats that were crossing the channel at the time including many of about the same size, with about the same number uh, of people on board. And uh, also the problem of surveillance. There was no fixed wing aircraft able to go in the sky and also a real lack of communication between British and French authorities. This boat was somewhere in between French waters and, and British waters in the channel, right on that dividing line between the two. So there is criticism here, but in contrast to a, a French investigation, which has ended up with five people being told that they could face criminal charges, there's nothing in here which actually holds somebody culpable. There are gentle recommendations for the future, only really uh, two of them, and a, a thought that things have improved over the past couple of years. But there's none of that sort of caustic criticism, none of that real, real forensic, I would say, analysis that the families of the victims have been calling to. I spoke to one of those relatives a little earlier who told me that he thought that this report was vague, ambiguous, lacking in detail and disappointing, said it was much worse than the French equivalent. The government, though, have already said that they are going to hold a what they call a non-statutory inquiry to, pry, to, pry, uh, to try to give some form of clarity for the families of the victims. We await, of course, the details about how that inquiry uh, will be held, who will be in charge, when it will start and what its scope will be. OK, for now, thanks. Chatting to Cordelia, who's in Jerusalem earlier, telling us that potentially a ceasefire, three-day ceasefire, let's talk about that, should we? Colonel Simon Diggins is here. Um, three-day ceasefire? Um, I think it'd be very welcome. Um, I think it also indicates the amount of pressure that's been put on the Israeli government by the Americans and others. Uh, the phrase that's been used around at the moment is what they call a window of legitimacy. And that phrase actually came from a former Prime Minister of Israel, who's also head of the armed forces. And what he said was that the window of legitimacy for what the Israelis are doing was starting to close. Uh, and so I think what has finally got through to Netanyahu is that that, that moment is, is fast approaching. And the balance between rightly eliminating Hamas but also not imposing a massive burden on the Palestinian people is, is probably that balance is starting to shift in people's minds. OK, um, ceasefire, pause, whatever phraseology you use, um, we are being told by Israel that, that would allow Hamas to refuel, restock. There's always the danger. Uh, and there's also, that's one of the challenges you're dealing with, with basically an organisation like Hamas. They could use that opportunity to, as you say, to reorganise, re, re, put more logistics into place. And the balance between that is, again, is the humanitarian effort that goes with it. So it's, a, it's, a, it's not an easy balance to make for commanders. But I think if Israel's looking at you know, what's its long-term solution, what's the long-term, and in terms of maintaining legitimacy and worldwide support for what they're doing, they may have to accept the, if you like, the burden or the friction of allowing the, the, the Hamas to refuel the arm against the greater gain of the chain uh, sort of humanitarian uh, imperative as well. Some reports of, of um, elite troops um, being trained in Lebanon to go into Gaza and extract British hostages. How complex and difficult would that be? I think that would be extremely complex and a very difficult operation to, to do. Um, the, the, we have troops who are well trained, we know that, um, and they obviously will have the opportunity to train in, in, in conditions similar to the ones going to Gaza. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't have any sort of details uh, on that. But it would be normal to do some very detailed training prior to a very high-risk operation like that. Mm. Uh, what are some of the dangers that they might face? Well, the danger is who are they, who are they recognise, and will they be accepted? So is this going under some sort of benign conditions where they've been told they can go and actually get them out, or where they regard as just another enemy force? 
uh, if they've grabbed an enemy, enemy, enemy force, and if they are killed or they are captured, worse still, captured, the situation could be could be even worse. So that's a that's a, these are high risk operations, and I mean uh, by the sound of it, it would be very high risk, very sort of high highly trained troops doing it, but there's a very high level of risk involved as well. We've heard a lot of rhetoric uh, from the Israelis, particularly the Prime Minister, over the last few days. He wants to obliterate Hamas, or words to that effect. He's used a lot of very strong words over the last few days. We've just heard um, our man um, on the Rafa border telling us that uh, an Israeli defence force uh, soldier there um, saying that it's not a humanitarian crisis in Gaza. I think we have to listen to the UN. I know that people are, are wary about the UN. I've worked with the UN three times. They, generally speaking, do not exaggerate, particularly as they've had long experience dealing with, with crises. Uh, we do know is that at the moment, and your reporter had that covered, that something like only a quarter of the normal supplies are getting through to, to them. Bear in mind that the infrastructure is badly damaged there, which means the normal distribution, which could just be an ordinary shop, won't necessarily be able to get. So it's not even just a matter of how much stuff gets in there. It's actually, can it get to people at the right time, the right place? People are on the move. They talked about some 50,000 people moving out yesterday from, uh, from Gaza, down, going further south. You know, how are they being received? Where are the reception centres? How are they getting fed, water? looked after, the injured looked after. These are very complex and very difficult logistic operations at the best of times. Do it in the middle of the war, when there's fighting still going on, and the Israelis are also bombing south of the Wadi Gaza, which is the so-called so protected area, uh, then that, make, I think, makes that very, very difficult. So, I mean, it's very hard from a distance to say whether it is a crisis or a challenge. And I think the Israeli commander suggested it was a challenge rather than a, rather than a crisis. Mm. But the UN is telling a different picture. And I said, my experience with the UN is they, don't, they tend not to exaggerate. Um, Two-state solution, that's what uh, a former UK ambassador to Lebanon was saying yeah. this morning is the only option. I've been doing this job a long time. I've heard that uh, said many, many times in the past. Uh, we've been close to it yeah. previously. How far away or close to we are uh, at the moment? I think at the moment, the two things that could, if you like, the dynamic could be working both ways. One, this is a huge crisis and it's made people refocus again on the two-state solution. Um, and I think that the accusation that's been laid against the Israeli governments since really 2005, 2007, uh, when they withdrew from Gaza, their, the settlements from Gaza, is the, the two-state solution has been ignored. In fact, not just made ignored, but actually made worse. And there's a sort of divide and conquer going on between Hamas and Gaza and Fatah in, in, in the West Bank. So I think it's a long way away from, from that. But it is probably the only solution which actually gives some kind of homeland to the Palestinian people as well. And whether we can get that out of, out of this crisis uh, will be hard to tell, but there's, okay. there's a lot of damage as well. Colonel, thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Much appreciated. Um, just want to uh, correct something uh, that we said a little bit earlier on, our correspondent chatting to her in Jerusalem. She said uh, about this potential ceasefire that we've been talking about and the hostage release in Gaza. Uh, she misspoke and uh, made a reference to US airstrikes, where she, of course, meant Israeli airstrikes in Gaza. Of course she meant that. Misspoke. Uh, apologies to uh, anyone who might have been confused or offended by that. Quick look at the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to fly. sponsored by Qatar Airways. Sunshine, showers turning dry into the weekend. Expect more rain on Sunday. Quite chilly now, windy with heavy showers in the west. Far south east, but much of the east is fine. There'll be sunny spells and further showers this morning with thundery downpours likely. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Labour smelling blood. And we're going to find out what's going to happen in the Commons in just a few minutes. Suella Bravman's future on the line. A minister's about to speak. Stay tuned.
about the Sco operational independence of the police. Shadow Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, around a month ago, Hamas perpetrated a sickening terrorist attack in Israel, murdering 1,400 innocent people, often in horrific circumstances. Around 200 people remain held hostage by Hamas, a terrorist organisation, and I'm sure the thoughts of the whole House are with those hostages today. We've also seen, in the United Kingdom, thousands of people demonstrating over recent weeks. Thanks to the tireless work of the police, these incidents have largely passed without significant incident. However, a number of arrests, now nearly 200 arrests, have been made where people have committed disorder, racially aggravated crimes or assaulted police officers, and it is right that police officers have acted robustly in those cases. It is also right that the police are operationally independent of government. That is, that is a fundamental principle of British policing, as the Prime Minister made clear yesterday. The Metropolitan Police asked protesters to postpone their planned protest this weekend, but the request was refused. The Prime Minister met with the Commissioner, I think yesterday, to seek reassurances that remembrance events will be protected. Uh, remembrance events, of course, play a special part in this nation's uh, long and proud history. And it would be uh, a grave insult if they were to be disrupted in any way. It is for the Metropolitan Police to decide whether to apply to the Home Secretary to ban any such march. Uh, as of this morning, no such application has been received, but the Home Secretary will, of course, carefully consider one should it be made. I would like to reiterate that the police retain the confidence of the Prime Minister uh, and the Home Secretary and I in using all their available powers, both under terrorism legislation and public order legislation, to prevent criminality and disorder and to prevent hate speech. And I would just say to the House, I've been contacted this morning um, repeatedly by members of the Jewish community who are deeply apprehensive about what this weekend may bring. And I want to put on record that we expect the police to protect those members of communities in London, including the Jewish community, who are feeling vulnerable this weekend. There are comprehensive powers in place to do that. Hate has no place on London's streets, and we expect the police to ensure the laws are upheld. There are powers to deal with uh, spreading hate, deliberately raising tensions through harassment and abusive behaviour. The police can impose conditions on marches, as indeed they have done, to prevent uh, pro-Palestine protesters approaching the Israeli embassy, to give one example. The police have also used Section 60 AA conditions to require people to remove face coverings. But the use of those powers is, of course, an operational matter for the Metropolitan uh, Police Service. Mr Speaker, this weekend should first and foremost be about remembering those who gave their lives in defence of this country. Any disruption to remembrance services would be completely unacceptable and an insult to their memory. Uh, and I have confidence the Metropolitan Police and other police forces will ensure this weekend passes off peacefully and without disruption. Yvette Cooper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, where is the Home Secretary? Exactly. Sent the policing minister to come to refuse to repeat her words, because we've seen her words this morning, attempting to rip up the operational independence of the police, attacking their impartiality in the crudest and most partisan of ways, deliberately undermining respect for the police at a sensitive time when they have an important job to do, deliberately seeking to create division around remembrance, which the policing minister rightly said should be a time for communities to come together and to pay our respects. And she is deliberately inflaming community tensions in the most dangerous of ways. She is encouraging extremists on all sides, attacking the police when she should be backing them. Absolutely. It is highly irresponsible and dangerous, and no other Home Secretary would ever have done this. 
Mr Speaker, remembrance events are really important to all of us. Those events need to be protected. That is the job of the police, to enforce, to respect the law, maintaining public safety, tackling hate crime and extremism, and respecting rights in law to peaceful protest. And they have to follow the law and the evidence, whatever politicians think, not be the operational arm of the Home Secretary. Because whether she likes it or not, that is the British tradition of policing, and I, for one, am proud of it. Yeah, we know yeah, what she's yeah, up to. Yeah, yeah. Claiming homelessness is a lifestyle choice, picking fights with the police to get headlines. But the job of the Home Secretary is to keep the public safe, not run an endless Tory leadership campaign. Yeah. Cabinet yeah. colleagues yeah. refusing to agree with her, former police chiefs lining up to condemn her. So two questions. Does this government still believe in the operation independence of the police and how can it do so while this Home Secretary is in post? And did the Prime Minister and Number 10 agree to the content of yeah, this article? Yeah, yeah. Because either the Prime Minister has endorsed this or he's too weak to sack her. And if he can't get rid of her, get a grip of her conduct, it means he's given up on serious government and he and the Home Secretary should both let someone else do the job. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I thank the Shadow Home Secretary for her questions, as always. Uh, she asked about where Hold the Home Secretary second, is. Hold on one second, Sam. Been wise to ask, Sam. Uh, privately rather than publicly. Chris Phil, Home Office Minister, I was about to say, a yeah. careful lie. He's doing a number of jobs in that statement. First of all, he is trying to calm tensions with the police, uh, praising them for some of their work. Secondly, he's effectively trying to clarify the Home Secretary's comments in this morning, saying this is important, that he and the Prime Minister and the Home Secretary have confidence in the Met Police commander and the Met Police operation. But thirdly, he was reiterating that underlying stance of government, which is that they are worried about the reaction of the Jewish community and what might happen on Saturday's march. Where does this all leave us? Well, we could see the Prime Minister taking action against Suella Braverman later today. But on the basis of that statement, it looks to me at the moment, on the balance of probabilities, I'm not nailing my colours to the mast, that this government wants to see if they can find a way through because they are worried that if Saturday's march gets ugly and he had sacked Suella Braverman and then she looks right and the Prime Minister looks wrong, where does that leave him? That's a great question. Very, very, very difficult situation for the PM today. I know you're going to monitor it throughout the day. For now, Sam, thanks very much indeed. While uh, Sam and others are digesting that, have a think about on this one. Ofcom has published its first guidelines to tackling illegal content online. The regulator has told social media platforms to exclude children from suggested friends lists, preventing children from becoming friends with or messaging unrelated people. Uh, should we talk about it um, in a little bit more detail with Melanie Dawes, Chief Exec of Ofcom? Hi, it's good to see you. And you too, we talked Kate. about this in some detail, as I remember, what, three years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the time, we talked about online cruelty, uh, can, uh, according to a Facebook whistleblower, online cruelty can be the last thing a child sees before they go to bed at night and the first thing they see when they wake up in the morning. Three years mm -hmm. later, how far have we come? Well, I think today is quite an important day because we now have regulation in place and that's what the parli our parliament passed a couple of weeks ago. And today, the regulator, that's Ofcom, has come out with a blueprint, really, of what the social media and search companies need to do to protect us and keep us safer online. So the industry can now see our expectations and I'm calling on them to work with us, give us feedback on our proposals, but also to start to make the changes because what we're proposing is very practical. As you say, it's stuff like making sure that kids can't be contacted by adults who might wish them harm. It's things like that. And I think the public is very much now on the side of seeing change. That whistleblower went on to say, Francis Haugen went on to say that organisations like Facebook um, unwilling to accept even a little sliver of profit being sacrificed to make its platform safer. Mm. What are you going to do about it? Well, fundamentally, the law has now changed, so they are required to but the uh, fine is have like a duty of care. Quid, is it? Something like no, that? we can charge some pretty hefty fines if we get to that place. Um, and I think that has changed now with the law because, as you say, up until now, there hasn't been regulation and there hasn't been regulation really anywhere in the world. Um, it's only just starting and the UK's ahead here. Um, and what that means is that it's only been about commercial profit. It's been about things like keeping us all online as much as possible to drive those advertising revenues. And now the law has changed and there is a duty of care and that is a legal requirement. So it's Ofcom's job to set out what that means in practice 
and to hold the companies to account. And that's what we're going to do. So what are the punishments? Well, um, fundamentally, um, if we see companies, and I don't want to go there today, um, I want to give everyone a chance to come and work with us, but I'm sure there will be some who don't want to do that. And we can fine them um, up to 10% of their global turnover. So it's a pretty serious amount of money. And fundamentally, if we think there are really serious risks to the public, we can actually get companies blocked so that they can't be visible to uh, the British public. So. I'm confident we've got all the right tools we okay. need and we start so we've today. We've come quite a long earnest. way in those three. We've years. come a very long way. Okay. Yeah. Um, why is it taking so long? Well, this is a really big set of laws and our parliament has debated them, you know, in some detail and I respect that. But what Ofcom's been doing during that time is getting ready. So only two weeks after the laws were passed, the moment Parliament was back this week, we've come straight out with a really comprehensive um, set of proposals. So we're managing to catch the time up now, I think. And you know, we are very committed to moving this as fast as we possibly can. But it's a lot to get through. But we've got the expertise, we've got the people, and there's a determination in Ofcom to really make a difference here. So these companies are on notice now. How long are they you going to give them? Well, what we're asking them, first of all, is um, what, what we're doing actually with the biggest companies straight away, we've started this already, um, is to put them into what we're calling our supervision programme. And that means that we'll start to use our legal powers to request information from them uh, straight away uh, so we can find out what's really going on under the bonnet. Because we've had some good engagement and we know quite a lot of things, but what we don't know is everything and the real facts of where they've got to. So we'll be doing that straight away. And then while these proposals go out for consultation and we get the views back during that period, I'm hoping we'll see some changes, you know, coming in quicker. But once the things, once, once our proposals today have actually gone into law properly in another year or so's time, at that point, we'll be able to start to launch investigations and take people through tougher processes if that's what we think they need to do. Today's a good day. It is a good day, yeah, but it's a long journey ahead and it's a big task for Ofcom and we're very aware of that. I mean, in the end, you know, we're doing this and our parliament has decided to do this because, you know, there's a lot of harm going on on social media and we've talked about that before, Kay. We have. Um, and we've talked about how women are more likely to experience, you know, sort of personal abuse than others online. And today we're really focusing actually on the risks to children. We know that a third of teenagers have had an unwanted friend or follower request in the last month. We know that one in six kids have actually been sent an image of someone half-dressed or naked or been asked for one in return. So this is not OK. And what we're doing today is setting out quite practical steps that we think will begin to address some of this, although there are no silver bullets here, but we know we can make some improvements. OK, Melanie Dawes, Chief Exec of Ofcom. Thanks very much. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Still to come on the... Bear with me one second, if you would, please, Melanie. Still to come on the programme for you. They hope to fly the World War II fighter plane around the world in four months. So you do. We speak to a pilot about his attempt to circumnavigate Earth in an old Spitfire. Well, I mean, this has been an issue um, for some time um, and it always gets worse around winter, which is the, classically the time that every year NHS services are under a lot more pressure. Um, and we're finding patients are opting to go privately for their for their healthcare um, because it's quicker and, and they feel they'll, they'll get a more prompt service. I think what's happening is um, things like on the day GP services or going to clinics locally that you can pay for. People are choosing to do that because often the wait for their GP can be, be a bit longer. Um, I think the, it does free up appointments, probably, but I think what would be better if we had an inclusive NHS system where everyone could be seen in time. We, you, we, in my practice, we have a triage system, so often the most serious people get seen on the day or quicker if, um, within the hour if we feel that they need to be seen. Um, for the more routine things, that's where people tend to struggle a little bit more, so um, it could be two weeks before they see a routine. Wow. Yeah, and that's a problem, which is why you're often seeing the routine things going to the private sector. Now, it's really important that people actually, if they're in the vulnerable groups get the COVID and the flu vaccines. Often there are extra services put in place because it's such an important thing because reducing the amount of people getting those um, illnesses actually takes pressure off the NHS. So there is a lot of push to get people done and um, getting these on the weekends or in their local pharmacy, places which are more accessible.
चलाई है मेरे चलाई पैर Fly Emirates, fly better. Uh, hello again. I'm excited because Matt Jones is here. Um, he is a, a Spitfire pilot. A pa Tom Cruise. Oh yeah, that Tom Cruise has said what you did is like climbing Everest. Tell us what you did. Uh, in 2019, we flew a Spitfire around the world to 26 countries, um, each of which had had the Spitfire flying at some point during the war. Uh, a boy's own adventure, really, but also a commemorative trip, the, the aim being to remind just not the UK, uh, but each country we went to, of the effect that this aeroplane had on, uh, on freedom and democracy around the world. OK, this is just a taster of the documentary. A vintage single engine a World War II fighter. Having to avoid the fog, the icing. This is challenging flying. I think we need to do something that no one has done before. Our mission is to fly that aeroplane around the world. Uh, it was an exceptional, exceptional trip to see. You know, the, the, the Spitfire stands for so much for so many people, particularly in this country, but also around the world. And to take that aeroplane and fly it low level in great conditions uh, and to see the world over the wing of this aeroplane was just the most exceptional, exceptional experience. What were the challenges? Big challenge is weather. Uh, nowadays, you can only fly a Spitfire uh, when you can see the ground. They can't fly in cloud anymore. Um, Why is that? Uh, just because of the way they're certified these days. It, back in the times of war, that wasn't a problem, obviously, no. but now they're thinking safety a lot more, so we're not allowed to do that. And travelling 700 miles, 800 miles at a time, imagine the weather in this country, and being able to fly from here to the Faroe Isles without seeing any clouds, it's, it's, it's tricky. We had to do that around the, the whole way around the world. Getting visas, getting permission, getting fuel, all really hard. Mm -hmm. And you did this just before the pandemic? Just before the pandemic, exactly. Our timing was extremely lucky because we obviously wouldn't have been able to do it for those two years. And then with the war in Russia after that, uh, the, the east coast of Russia, which we flew two and a half thousand miles over, would be close to us now. So, as I say, our, our, our timing was extremely lucky as it happened. What was your support network like? So there's a team of six of us, three pilots. Uh, two of us had the idea, myself and a guy called Steve Brooks. Uh, we had another RAF pilot flying with us, Ian Smith, and then uh, engineer, great mate of mine, Ben Utley, who did all the videography for the, for the documentary, uh, and a project director, uh, Lachlan Munro. And the six of us went off in a support aeroplane, those who weren't flying the actual, aeroplane, the, the actual Spitfire. And how long did it take? It took us four months. Wow. Yeah. Is that how long you expected it? To yeah, to, to the hour. Oh, really? <laughs> Bizarrely. Oh, that's just showing off. Completely um, by chance, <laughs> but to the hour. Tell yeah. me about the documentary. The documentary is out on Sunday, which is Remembrance Sunday, of course, of course. at nine o'clock on Sky History. Mm, OK. And what does it document? What do we see in the documentary? So you see a lot of the emotion, a lot of the passion, a lot of uh, the grit and determination that went into it, but you also see the most beautiful vistas. This aeroplane, one of the most beautiful aircraft, possibly the most important aircraft ever built, over some of the most incredible scenery that the, our planet has to offer. So few left now, the Spitfire. So few left, yeah. And this, so we, we got a world record for doing it. No one, it turns out, had been silly enough to have a go at doing this before. Uh, and uh, so we're very proud of that world what record. What happens to the aeroplane now? So the aeroplane now lives with between us and a, and a, a guy in, um, in Denmark. So I fly it still every summer for air shows and people get to, get to see it and then it, and then it sort of goes home to Denmark where, where it now lives for the winter. OK, so Sky History? Sky History, This nine Sunday, 9 o'clock. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you very well much, Well done. Kay. Thank Appreciate you for joining it. us. Thank, Thank you. you. Is it the weather for Spitfires today? Warm memories wherever you go. The Weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Back to sunshine and showers today, uh, turning drier into the weekend, but expect more rain on Sunday. Quite chilly now, windy with heavy showers in the west and the far southeast, but much of the east is fine. 
There'll be sunny spells and further showers this morning with thundery downpours likely, but many eastern parts looking like they'll stay dry. It'll be colder than recently uh, and windy in the south with gales returning to the southwestern coasts and hills. The Weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. 46 days until Christmas, which can only mean one thing. Venus flytrap. That's a stretch, isn't it? The highly anticipated ad features a soundtrack by the Italian singer Andrea Botticelli, um, and it's of course a tearjerker. <laughs> there we go. Uh, that's it from me for today, and indeed for the week. I'm back from seven o'clock on Monday. Will Suella Braverman still be the Home Secretary by then? Labour don't want her to be. The Prime Minister is in quite a pickle. Continuing coverage on Sky. See you Monday, 7 o'clock. Do hope so. <laughs>